So Clerk uh, Stolarz, are we ready? We are back online. Maybe if we could just make sure that those who are just remote, uh, Councillor Rice, you're able to hear us and you're connected. Okay, let me start. Uh, Councillor Wright, can you hear us? Uh, Councillor Stevenson, can you hear us? Councillor Paquette, can you hear us? Good morning. Hmm, okay. Councillor, oh, we'll try again then. Councillor Wright, can you hear us? Councillor Stevenson? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, and Councillor Hamilton? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, Councillor uh, Cartmel? Yep, I can hear you. Hmm. Councillor Rice? Uh, good morning. Okay, and so only person can't, maybe she's not in the meeting yet. Councillor Wright? Yes, I'm there here. There we go, good, okay. Everyone, you can hear us now. Uh, why don't I read the names, uh, start the, the names at the start for uh, item 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, okay. Uh, Christine Lee, to answer questions only. Here. Uh, Scott Cole, to answer questions only. Okay, in person. Keith Davies, in person, to answer questions only. Uh, Catherine Oberg, uh, in person, to answer questions only. Uh, Tony Shoyalo, uh, select engineering, in person, or remotely. Good morning, I'm remote, thank you. Thank you. And Yana Rahman, to answer questions only, call, call, remote. Oh, you're a person, okay, here you go. Uh, no one is in opposition. Okay. All right, now selection. Colleagues, select bylaws. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I would like to select 3.7, please. 3.7. All right, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, I'd like to select items uh, 3, 12, 13, and 14, please. 3, 12, 13, 14, okay. Uh, Councillor Prince Babe. Thank you. I'd like to select item 3.11. 3.11. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. I'll select uh, 3.9 and 3.10, please. 3.9, Okay, so 3.7 is selected. 3.9, 3 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14. Okay, Councillor Cartmel, can you move the balance? Good morning, yes, Mayor Sohi, I'll move closure of the public hearing on items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, and 3.8. Second. Second by Councillor Rice, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move first reading of the aforementioned items. So can. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move second reading of the aforementioned items. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third reading of the aforementioned items. 
Second. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20602, Bylaw 20603, Charter Bylaw 20604, Charter Bylaw 20606, Bylaw 20588, Charter Bylaw 20611, and Charter Bylaw 20618. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That's carried. Okay, we are on to item 3.7, Charter Bylaw 20605 to allow for continued recreational uses and development of institutional uses done loose. Exempted by Councillor Rutherford. And No one is in opposition, no one is in favor. And Councillor Rutherford, do you need a presentation? Okay. Uh, we'll go to administration for a presentation. Thank you. Good morning. This application proposes to rezone the site from AP to US to allow continued recreational uses and the development of a school. Next slide, please. The subject site is approximately 26.3 hectares in size, located central to the Dunluce neighborhood between 153rd Avenue and 157th Avenues Northwest. The site includes baseball and soccer fields, a skate park, and a playground. The proposed US zone will allow for the development of a high school along 153rd Avenue with construction from 2023 to 2025. The future Metro LRT station will be located along 153rd Avenue Northwest and will be constructed when funding becomes available. Next slide, please. The U.S. Zone will bring the entire site under the U.S. Zone to ensure the site can be developed for public educational services, allowing for flexibility with utility constraints. It will allow for the development of a school and be compatible with existing and surrounding uses. The proposed rezoning aligns with the city plan by providing a school to serve the student population that can be accessed through all forms of transportation and creating gathering spaces for recreation to support both formal and informal uses. Next slide, please. Administration sought feedback through the use of the city's webpage, the Edmonton Journal, and through mail-out notices to surrounding landowners and the community leagues. Common concerns included increased traffic and on-street parking, increased noise, and a loss of open space. Next slide, please. Administration recommends approval of the Charter Bylaw 20605 because it will continue to allow for recreational facilities, it will allow for the development of institutional uses in the form of a school, and it complies with the city plan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, no one in favor, no one in opposition. Now we'll go to, uh, we can go to questions to administration. Councillor Leatherford. Yeah, I was under the understanding that someone from Open Spaces was going to come as the applicant and register to speak. Is that not correct? Sarah Ramey from uh Parks and Open Space Senior Planner is on the line and is the applicant as well. We okay. can just change that for so, uh, the So minutes. are they, do they need to register to speak as an applicant, not as part of administration? Either or. Well, the clerk, what would you advise? Sorry, can or you? Or legal. This is like the uh, city is the applicant and people from the parks and open spaces are the applicant, right? Yeah, and, I would uh, recommend that Ms. Ramey uh, register as the applicant and that council um, approve her to speak okay, uh, on good. behalf of the applicant. So can we please uh, um, um, read his name into the, uh, Ramey? Uh, Sarah Ramey. Sarah Ramey be uh, uh, added as in favor as to well. 3.7. As well as Enrique, I'm sorry, I'm just waiting on his last name. Rike, okay. Enrique Paris. Okay. So I can move that we hear from those speakers on item 3.7. Yes. Second. Okay. 
No Sorry. motion is needed for that. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so we don't need to approve the speakers? No, no. they're okay. already added to, will Perfect. be added to the list now. So that was Sarah Rem Reme and? Enrique Perez. Enrique Perez. Okay. Uh, are they making presentations or to un answer questions only? Can you please confirm, Sarah and Enrique, are you to answer questions only or are you making a presentation? Uh, we're here to answer questions only. Okay, Councillor Rutherford, please go ahead. Yeah, so just my questions to the applicant. Um, a few to start. Uh, where is the, the concept plan for this district park? Are you looking for the concept plan for the park in its entirety or... We, we approved school. at budget. We approved at budget. Cons we we approved at budget furthering the district planning for this park space. And so I'm just wondering, where is that in the queue in the process? Are we? Do we have a really solid concept of that park? Uh, just where are we? So we've. Um through the budget, uh, the concept plan has been reviewed, but we're also working closely with the Edmonton Catholic School Board. So they've started construction on their site. Yeah. Um, and we'll be discussing with Edmonton Public School Board uh, a different uh, site through their design as well. Uh, but the, yeah. the concept plan, is the funding is allowing us to have those conversations with the school boards as they're doing their design work as well. Well, I, I would hope that that funding isn't supporting that because that would have been something that would have been standard practice. But um, so I, why I understand the need for the Catholic school, high school space within the district park to be rezoned to U.S. zone. I'm not understanding why the need to rezone the entire park from AP to U.S. zone. Uh, so it's more of a standard practice when we, we do a zoning, we don't like to leave a site split zoned. So um, because a portion of that needed to be zoned U.S., uh, and it is a preference for the school boards to work within the U.S. zoning. Uh, but that, but we, that site is already split because you have the YMCA, Castle Downs YMCA, that's a U.S. zone within that space. No, that's also city-owned land. I think it's when we've got an, an opportunity to be proactive uh, and clean up a zoning situation, we'll take that opportunity. Okay, so so if I'm understanding this correctly, we're gonna re, if we approve this today, we're rezoning the entirety of Castle Downs Park to an urban services zone with other than the Catholic high school in the, along 153rd and the future LRT station, we have no understanding. We, we as council have no understanding or sight lines as to what is going to be in Castle Downs Park. And it could be anything that is approved in the US zone. Is my understanding correct? And we have not finished the concept plan for that district park. Uh, so with respect to the concept plan, we're at, at early stages. We did just hire a design consultant and I'm getting some, some information here from IIS. Uh, I can hand it over to Enrique if uh, you want some more detail too on the concept plan. I, I mean, it's more just sequencing, right? Like the, the, I think at the end of the day, my question is, do we have a concept? Is the concept plan finalized? I think we're working towards the concept. We've got a design consultant on board, so we haven't finalized it, but we are working with the Edmonton Catholic School Board with their provincial funding to make sure that the changes that they're putting onto the park would align with what, where, we're, where we are looking to go to for the concept plan. But that's because we, okay, now I'm even more confused with that answer because we would have had to do that work with the Catholic School Board regardless of that funding package because that funding package was actually added in discussion around the football, uh, the football team there. So now, now I'm even more confused by that answer. So wouldn't that work already progress with or without a service package with the Catholic School Board? And isn't that service package broader to the entirety of the park? Councillor, if I may, Enrique Perez here, I apologize, I, I was um, late getting to the meeting. The, the concept design uh, was initiated to 
to, in a, in a sense, balance competing interests. Uh, the, the Catholic board is, as Sarah, my colleague, was saying, is proceeding with instruction. Uh, it's the status of the public school building is unknown at this time, uh, and because uh, the ET, ETS is also planning a transit facility, it was determined that uh, a redesign of the park would be essential to make sure everyone's interests are best met. So it didn't need a funding package at budget? It's my understanding what we, we transferred this project to IIS and so this project has uh, funding to proceed to uh, a new concept, yes. Okay, how come um, within this report it's the first time I'm hearing about a public school on that site? The, the, the existence or not of the public school is undetermined at this time. Uh, we have two previous FIT studies that we have to uh, refer to and a consultation with the school board will determine whether or not that site is required by them. Yeah, no worries. Uh, thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Any other questions, colleagues? Uh, okay. Uh, can someone move the second round, please? Move the second round. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Need a second, Councilor Tang? Okay, please vote. Councilor Stevenson is a yes. Thank you, Councilor. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That's carried. So while it's in while it's in concept, where are we discuss in discussions with the public school about where a park is going to be located, and is it a high school and an elementary school? What what are what what are we talking about here? Typically, it would be a high school on a district park. So we'd have a Catholic high school, a public high school, the y Castle Downs YMCA, and an LRT station, as well as a, the Seahawks um, space and, and their facility. Is that correct? That's correct. There are a lot of competing interests on this site. And so that's why uh, rather than proceeding on an, on an ad hoc basis and trying to fit things in one at a time, it was determined that uh, the park really does require uh, a rethinking. Yeah, so I, and I don't disagree. I absolutely, I mean, that's one of the reasons I advocated for that funding package at budget. I just, I guess where I'm concerned is, and, and the decision before us today is, am I comfortable with a blanket rezoning of the entire th thing as urban services, not knowing what that concept looks like or what will actually be going where and how much green space is actually being preserved. I guess that's where I'm, I'm coming from. Any thoughts on that and anything that you would want me to, to consider in my decision making as the applicant around that pause? Well, the, the urban services would not in any way hinder our ability to, to, to program the park. If anything, it'll just align with our standard practice, the school board's preference, which we try to accommodate under the joint use agreement. Uh, as, a, as a partner to them. And, um, you know, it, it, it does provide a, a similar uh, flexibility in terms of our own park programming. Okay, I think I'll have more questions for administration and then I might come back to the applicant again. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Um, just, just for my understanding, are district parks typically zoned uh, U.S. sort of regardless of their balance of, of use between green space, uh, schools, other recreation facilities? Yes, district parks are typically zoned U.S. They allow for a few more uses too, like libraries, things that we can um, work with a little bit more flexibly within that zone. Okay, so, so sort of regardless of what the concept plan may result in, um, the implementation of the, the district plan concept would likely result in a U.S. zoning for the full site? Yes. So in new neighborhoods, when we see a district park, uh, we'll zone at U.S. Uh, at the initial zoning stages to allow for that flexibility as the concept plan develops. Okay. Well, thanks. That's helpful context. Appreciate it. No further questions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, so that concludes questions to the applicant. No one is in opposition. At this time, we can go to questions to administration.
Okay. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Can you walk me through the, uh, the approved and discretionary uses within an urban services zone? I can. Let me just pull that up quick. So the permitted uses under the current zone are cemeteries, child care services, community recreation services, government services, public education service or private education services, public parks, public libraries and cultural exhibits, religious assemblies, special events, supportive housing, urban gardens, uh, fascia on present signs, uh, and a variety of signs. I won't go through the signs. In terms of discretionary uses, we have commercial uh, schools, uh, detention and correction services, exhibition and co convention centers, extended medical treatment services, funeral, cremation, and inter internment services, health services, indoor participant and recreational services, lodging houses, market, natural science exhibits, outdoor participation, recreation services, private clubs, protective and emergency services, recycled material drop-off centers, specialty food services, restaurants, bars and neighborhood pubs, spectator entertainment establishments, spectator sports establishments, indoor urban farms, urban outdoor farms, freestanding, uh, a variety of signs. And then the discretionary ones would be, uh, again, at the discretion of the development officer when looking to approve those. Okay. This should allow for all of the uses um, for all the ultimate park design. Yeah. Councillor, if I just may add, uh, as we go through these district park planning exercises, it's important to remember that the city owns uh, the majority of the land and is looking to go through that concept planning phase uh, with the various competing interests, whether it be school boards or, or part of the other uh, football associations, um, which is why uh, as Ms. Ramey had pointed out previously, uh, most of these, if not all, these district plans are zoned U.S. to allow that flexibility, but ultimately we retain control through that ownership. Um, mm -hmm. And today we're at the, the zoning level to ensure that uh, yeah. these, the schools, the Catholic School Board can go forward. Um, and yeah, and I, and I don't it's in a complete parcel that's not yeah. subdivided, which is why we don't want that split zoning. A, I don't know why that wouldn't have come forward. The Catholic School Board has been discussed and, and that we did a sod turning in, in, in the spring. I'm not sure why that already wasn't properly zoned before we did a sod turning. Um, I get that. I, I understand everything that you're saying. But it boils down. No, I have to say that for speaking. Um, I'm just trying to frame a question. I guess what, if we approve it as an U.S. zone in its totality today, because I think I'm contemplating only approving the Catholic high school area or putting a motion or an amendment f around the, the map, um, if we approve the entire U.S. zone today, what check-ins and balances are there with council? Because a lot of things end up then uh, with other park spaces, n you know, getting noted as surplus land. And I have a few examples in my ward like that, and that doesn't come back as a check-in. So that's what I'm concerned about. What, what, what check-ins on this park come to council? And maybe that's a question for open spaces. I don't know. I can't speak specifically to the check-ins, but I do know that this is through the municipal reserve that it was uh, acquired to the city. So there are some additional legal restrictions on title, um, which would limit some of the uses. Um, Can you, what are those restrictions? I, I'd have to double check the, the specifics on it. Perhaps that would be a good question for uh, open space as well. Okay, restrictions. So any, any of the uses that don't fall under, under municipal reserve, and if we were looking to dispose of it, um, we would have to come back to council to remove the MR designation first of all. Uh, so that's one check-in. Um, so that's if, can you repeat that? I don't under, think I understood. So if there was a proposed use on there that didn't fit the municipal reserve designation uh, and through admins various processing, whether it's uh, following a surplus. But that's after it's already built, right? That would be like reverting it back? No. Uh, so if there was a use that was proposed that didn't fit municipal reserves um, and 
there was a point in time where everyone thought that was a good idea. We would have to come back to council to remove that municipal reserve designation before that project could go forward. Sorry, I need another round. I'm not understanding. No problem. Uh, okay. Councilor Principe, can you take the chair, please? Sure. Right, Thank right. you. So I just want to understand this, too. Like, if the concept plan, you know, applicant said that that's in the works, right? So would rezoning to U.S. limits the ability? Because uh, the, the discretionary uses, uh, sorry, permitted use is a long list of mm -hmm. things, right? And they all will not be accommodated, right? So concept plan will kind of narrow it down what should be done on that part. All of the uses that would be contemplated in the concept plan would be available to the applicant under the U.S. zone. And then they'll be narrowed down, right, to whatever is accommodated or is able to be accommodated on that, that park. So that does, does keeping it AP or changing it to US, how does that any, how does that impact? There's more limitations on the AP zone. Um, for instance, the institutional use is the library. So there are things that we would desire to see in a, a district park or a district area um, with a larger service area that wouldn't be available under AP, but we would be available under the US zone. Okay. The other component to it would be the that it's one solid site. So that site has not yet been subdivided. And again, speaking to the split zoning, um, we don't typically um, want to see a single site that is zoned with multiple zones without the legal boundaries um, in place of a subdivision. Okay. And how does changing from AP to US limits the green space? Does it, it, it does not. All of those uses remain. Okay. Yeah, public parks is available under there. And what the size of the public park will be determined based on the concept plan discussions, right? And whatever, yes, that's uh, uh, what other things that community needs accommodated. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, I will move the second round. Yeah, oh, sorry. Constant Salvador is next. Constant Salvador, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah just <clears throat> really briefly. Um, just looking for um, a little bit more of an explanation around like why why now would be the suggested time to to move forward with the rezoning just in terms of sequencing mm -hmm. um so i believe the land was acquired in the 70s uh, there were different zones in place there and that's why the ap zone is what you see on that land typically right now what we would have done is is rezoned it to us right off the get-go it wouldn't have had an ap um, zoning in the interim um, that being said, um, typically the sequencing of this would be to prepare the school site with the U.S. zone um, for a district service level uh, area, um, and then the concept planning can continue from there, and any further uses that might need to be subdivided could be accommodated at that time. Okay, so the AP in and of itself was an interim use. It was the original zoning yeah. in place with a different zoning bylaw, okay, as you're going to see, I guess, with the new yeah. change up for a little bit here. Um, okay, okay, that's helpful. So I guess this isn't straying from a typical process if the intended use is a district park. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Can you move the second round, Constance? Oh, yes, I'll move the second round. Second. Constance Principal, second, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, that is carried. Councillor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Okay, just, I guess, going back, I'm, I wasn't fully understanding, so if it's rezoned to U.S. zone, it still has municipal reserve designation. Is that, is my understanding, so, am I tracking so far? You are, typically. Uh, there is a little bit of another complexity with this site, um, is that the site itself uh, was acquired through the MR designation, MR uh, processes so that it is on title uh, so what can be used on site uh, is also governed by that uh, legislation uh, so when when Ms. Hazinga said Ms. Hazinga said all of those uses are all of those uses allowed with that MR on title so or zoning zoning is generally permissive in nature um, and then what can be put on or what can be 
developed has to follow these other regulations, uh, specifically when it comes to those municipal reserve parcels um, or sites governed by the municipal reserve. Um, and those are then limited. Uh, it doesn't mean that the zoning isn't proper or isn't mm -hmm. uh, a good fit or compatible, is that there's a, just additional layer of restrictions that can be used uh, on that site. Uh, and typically, as mentioned, these, these district park sites are U.S. sites uh, because it allows for that wider range. Uh, it's a very standard zone that's applied across the city in different school sites, different uh, district parks uh, because of the varying different uses. Um, so we don't want to look to further restrict uh, mm -hmm. through zoning uh, what can be on those sites because it allows that concept planning to go through its different phases. It allows the parks uh, to go through its different evolutions uh, through its life uh, and provides that flexibility within it. Um, and the key here is there's those two triggers. One is that we're looking to get the site ready for the school, uh, and the other is taking that opportunity uh, to do some pre-planning in terms of zoning work uh, around the district park concept planning. Uh, so it's to align those two things today. Yeah, okay. Um. I think I'm gonna just ask it and then if it's for the applicant then we can switch back there. I guess I'm, I'm still, an outstanding question I have is, it's similar to, to my colleagues, they, but theirs was the sequencing of, of this. Why is this coming now when this Catholic school has been in the works for years, that site has been determined, we did a sod turning in spring when we didn't have a proper zoning for it. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm really, not under, and if that's a question for parks and open spaces, happy to ask that to them. But like, why wasn't this done two years ago instead of today? So we, we would like all of our development processes to be lockstep and linear. Uh, that doesn't happen uh, very often, especially when we're dealing with uh, some of these older sites um, that aren't. But it puts us in quite a conundrum because if we were to say no to the urban services zone, and delay the Catholic school when they're the, literally the provincial government did a sod turning. That's awkward. So there, <laughs> the schools are discretionary use within the AP zoning itself. So there is a path forward okay. uh, for permitting. Okay. However, okay. it is, is standard that our schools are, are zoned US because it allows uh, some additional uses um, and possibilities on that site. Uh, okay. So this is the preferred standard of practice uh, to have the school sites US. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Prince, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a question uh, about the zoning. If it is zoned, if the zoning passes today and it's uh, under US, would, let's say, um, an applicant came with a, uh, an application for a medical treatment centre, would that just be approved? Or would it have to come in front of Council if it's, on, if it's zoned US? Just confirming with planning coordination, that's a, a permitted use in the zones. It's a discretionary use in the zones. So it yes. wouldn't come before council, but it would be um, either approved or refused at the discretion of the development officer. And it would be subject to any statutory plans that are in place in the area. So if there was something in the statutory plan that said this would be a great use for this area, um, you know, likely would militate towards an approval, but if there was something in the plan that said that it wouldn't be a, a great use in the area or wouldn't be a preferred use, it would militate towards a refusal for the development officer. Councillor, just to add, um, <clears throat> the city does own the site and we are doing those uh, concept planning on it, uh, which, which is what we would follow. Uh, so not uh, any old use within that zone, it would have to follow that concept planning. And we'd also need to go through the surplus school sites, uh, or surplus system. Um, so it had come before you before that site was deemed surplus and the entire site is also governed by a joint use agreement which would be considered in the um, development officer's uh, decision. And, oh. and sorry, I just would add one more layer which is, I know it's getting complex here, but if it does have a municipal reserve designation, the MGA says currently with an MR designation on it, it can only be used for a public park, a public recreation area, a school board purposes, or to separate areas of land that are used for different purposes. Um, so there is, um, just going back to that conversation, there is a tightened uh, 
use sort of that can be had on that land, notwithstanding those permitted uses, the MGA does step in and it provides some boundaries that are um, tighter or more restrictive than the zoning that would be in place. Okay, so something so, to, to consider. So Sorry, whether it's speaking. AP or US, yes, we, the it was MGA? It. Because with, of the municipal reserve. Yes, ma'am. With the municipal of, reserve designation on, the MGA does step in and create um, tighter restrictions. And um, yeah, so just some things to consider. I know there's a lot of layers to this. Yeah, there are. And uh, other district parks across the city, how many are still zoned AP? How many are zoned US? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have that number. Any idea? Council, we do know that we do try and get out ahead of that. This was an old legacy site really from the early 80s, I suppose. Um, going forward, when we do have a district site, Lewis Farms being a great example, we've already zoned that site to US in anticipation of these kind of broader community uh, recreational uses that will be coming in the future. And was it zoned from AP to US? It was probably... Sorry, it was probably zoned from agricultural right to US. Right, right agricultural. from the get-go. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that, that's common practice today. This is unusual in, again, that it was it sat vacant for a long time. There were no schools planned. Now, as they're on their way, we're getting we're bringing it back up to where we sh probably should have zoned it initially. But it had more of a, a broader parks use at that time. No schools were planned. Now it does. This is the, the common practice today. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Principal. Councilor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I guess my concern is those ball diamonds and soccer fields. What happens to those and is there other, other supply uh, in the area? Um, that would depend on the ultimate design uh, for the district park. So it would be determined based on which uses end up fitting within the site and which ones were, were determined to be um, the ones to move forward with. As of right now, those will, will remain intact as far as I'm aware. Okay, and then, so does that come to council then if, if that was to change? No, it does not. Okay, is, is there other facilities within the area? Councillor, just a reminder, we aren't here to discuss the removal uh, okay. of these yes, parks. I know. <laughs> um, the parks will still remain under the U.S. zoning. Uh, the, the city is undergoing uh, a detailed constant plan in conjunction with the, the various school boards and the other users on it uh, with the ultimate goal to, to fit uh, what is needed within the community um, and for sports fields as well within it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wright. So that concludes the questions to administration. At this time, uh, I will ask if council members have any questions uh, uh, to the applicant or administration, uh, any new information arising out of the previous conversation. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, you do, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. to the applicant, go ahead. Uh, just with the concept plan, will that come back? Like, does that get in? I don't. This is the first time I've seen like a district park concept plan um, process as a newer councillor. Does that concept plan need to be endorsed by council? Or is there any mechanism within the, the, the district park planning for, for council uh, approval or input? So at this point, only the concept design phase has been funded. So prior to anything happening on the site, it will come back to council with a budget request for delivery funding. Uh, so that will be a formal opportunity to look at the design and, and decide whether uh, it will proceed forward or not. Uh, there's also less formal check-ins. There is a project webpage, uh, and there will also be updates through the Building Edmonton Capital Project Tracker. So that's updated quarterly. So have you done any public engagement on the district park yet? I don't believe that started. Uh, so the design consultant has been hired, uh, but the, the rest of the project hasn't started yet. And are, can you uh, walk me through what was in the scope for public engagement with the residents? I know there's a lot of other competing interested in terms of stakeholders, public school, Catholic school, sports groups. Um, what is the scope in terms of the community? And I would say both 
you know, the ca Castle Downs writ large, including overlap with mine and Councilor Principe's uh, wards. Yeah, Councilor, there was an extensive stakeholder list uh, for this project. Um, I'm, I'm unaware of what uh, the current status of the public engagement plan, but uh, as part of the concept development, um, there were there's typically a series of of uh, information gathering from from particular users and uh, general users, uh, and the uh, designer does his best to balance competing yeah. interests on the site. Yeah, but it, I guess my question, I I I, I don't guess. I, I, further to that, what level of engagement would the public be engaged at? Is it advise or is it refine? Is it create? That would depend on the particular uh, public engagement plan process developed. Typically, there's various check-ins with both stakeholders, uh, particular stakeholders and the public. So there's an information gathering component and then there's uh, information which allows uh, additional comments and, and input and refinement of the concept. And I'll say the public engagement plan has just been initiated. Uh, yeah. We can follow up with you after uh, if you want more information on how that evolves. Yes, uh, definitely appreciate that. Okay, and then I guess just going back to that MR question. Um, so how does that MR designation affect the district planning? Uh, would you have to come back then? So let's say you do decide that you're going to build one of the, a library, let's just use the library as an example, um, in, 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 the, in this district park. Would that be under the MR or not under the MR? Uh, so a library is probably the strangest example you could have taken because it's the one kind of parks use that doesn't uh, fit within the MGA. So for a library, you would actually have to take off the municipal reserve, uh, but most other uses that you would think that would fit on a park would, would fit within that definition and, and stay there. Yeah, well, I mean, but like, I think, I, you know, I'm thinking about, again, just certain things that like cemeteries or crematoriums, I can tell you right now, are not gonna be well received by the residents I represent or in Councilor Principe's nodding her head. So I guess, would that be a, a, an allowable thing within the municipal reserve designation? Councilor, something like a cemetery or a crematorium wouldn't fit within those defined terms okay. in the Perfect. MGA, so um, reserve would have to come off. The res and that has to come back to council for Correct. the reserve That's, to come yeah, off. It has to. Okay, okay. Thank you for uh, uh, walking me through this process. Appreciate the answers. Thank you. So that concludes questions on any new information. At this time, we are ready to close the public hearing on this bylaw. Will someone move closing of the public hearing, please? I'll move closure of the public hearing. Second. Uh, that was Councilor Paquette or Councilor Council Council Paquette. Councilor Paquette, okay. All right, so we have, we're closing the public hearing on this bylaw. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move first reading of Charter Bylaw 20605. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a first reading on the floor. At this time, I will open the floor for council members to speak. All right, Councilor Rutherford. Yes, thank you, and, and thank you to my colleagues for indulging my questions. I, I completely respect and understand that, you know, U.S. zone is a typical zone for a district park. Um, which, which this is, I think for me, even in my short tenure on council thus far, I'm seeing so many green spaces, particularly in the ward I represent, that are um, getting developed. They're not staying as green spaces, uh, both for passive use or active use, whether it's a, a field. Uh, you know, Wellington's a good example by the Calder Library that entire green space is going to be developed between multiple things that are being engaged on right now with the community. 
there's another uh, permanent supportive housing that will be coming to public hearing in Athlone that's taking away another piece of green space. So you will excuse my hesitancy when I am very concerned about this big park space. It means a lot to residents in the ward I represent and, and I will you know, speak on behalf of Castle Downs residents as, as a whole is really important and I can see it already chipping away. I can see, okay, well now we've got the Catholic school, then we're gonna have an LRT station eventually, then we're gonna now potentially talk about a public school and then there's already uh, you know, other competing interests like a potentially a, so a football dome or a soccer dome. And, I, and I'm left thinking, where's the actual green space that's going to be left in, in this park? I mean, I feel like I was a bit, it's a bit of a, a challenge because you know, based on the answer today, I also am in a really rock and a hard place because I don't want to hold up the Catholic school. I know it's a discretionary use, but I still would like it to be cleaner. Um, but ideally, you know, ideally that was zoned separate and we could have the concept plan finalized before we're, we're rezoning the rest of the park. I'm heartened by the fact that there's a municipal reserve on title that has provided me some level of comfort in this, but I do want to be very clear with both the applicant, uh, well, with the applicant, that my expectations on public engagement for this very important park space are very, very high. And public engagement that involves the broader general public, not just the stakeholders that were mentioned in this discussion. It's absolutely essential and it's essential to me that they have true influence on, on this park concept. Um, so I will be supporting it today. I put my trust in administration. Um, but again, I do want to highlight that I'm seeing a pattern and I'm seeing a pattern that's concerning to me um, in, in the ward I represent. And it might be other, place, other wards too, I don't know. I can only speak for what I'm seeing in where I sort of have the purview to, to be looking closely. And uh, I hope that as this district park is developed and as we're looking at surplus green spaces, we're re really taking a sober second thought because there is something invaluable about open passive green spaces that I think we're, we're forgetting and overdeveloping parks is great in areas like the district parks, for sure, but not all of our park spaces need to be developed. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just a trend I'm seeing. So pardon my hesitancy with this long list of now approved uses. Um, I will support it with the caveat again that the concept planning has ex exceptional engagement with the public as well as a uh, high level of influence beyond probably advise I would like to see at least in the concept plan. If we're only at advise at concept, that's very concerning to me. So I just wanna highlight that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Principe, can you take the chair, please? Sure, I have the chair. Thank you. I, I would also expect as Councillor Rutherford has mentioned, there'll be a very deep engagement uh, with the with the community, yes, there are a number of stakeholders that are interested in that site that they'll be engaged with. I think uh, community voices also needs to be amplified and included to the level that community determines what goes on that, uh, that park through that concept plan discussion. Another thing I absolutely am I'm glad that Councilor Rutherford and Councilor Principe are raising these questions. Uh, I am noticing more and more that there are certain areas in our city that do not abut uh, uh, River Valley or uh, a ravine system and they are lacking passive green spaces. I think that is something we really need to be uh, cognizant of. Uh, our city is a beautiful city and our River Valley is a beautiful River Valley and our creek system and ravine systems are beautiful and they provide abundance of uh, passive and active active activities to uh, to residents, uh, but there are a lot of areas in the city that are far far away from uh, those creeks and ravines and and the river valley, and uh, we need to have more equitable approach uh, to determining uh, how we how we decide on green green spaces in uh, 
in, in those areas. I think that also goes to tree planting. Uh, I have noted this, I'm just speaking broadly about these equity issues, right? Uh, I have noticed more trees being planted close to the creek system and the ravine system, not in the areas that are actually on boulevard that are lacking those amenities. I think we need to start applying the equity lens throughout the, throughout the city and have making sure that everyone has access to, uh, to green spaces. I think I, that should also determine uh, where we develop in those areas. If there are areas that uh, I think having a uniform approach sometimes does not keep equity lens in, uh, in, in mind. I think just kind of flagging that as we kind of further our understanding about some of these areas that are, have not been, have not seen the kind of green spaces that uh, other areas do see. Okay. okay. With that, I will uh, take the chair back and go to- uh, The chair is yours. Okay. Uh, Councillor. So, okay, uh, we will go to vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, Rutherford, so sorry, that was 3.7, Councillor Rutherford selected, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, um, I'll move second reading of Charter Bylaw 20605. Okay. Second. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move consideration of third reading for Charter Bylaw 20605. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20605. Second. Okay, please vote. We're just waiting on one vote. Oh. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Okay, next one. We have 3.9, 3.10, bylaw 20607 to amend McTaggart Neighborhood Area Structure Plan and Charter Bylaw 20608 to allow for mid rise multi unit housing. McTaggart, exempted by Councillor Cartmel. And will be I'll go through the list again to ensure that everyone is here. Uh, Alison Rosland. Yes, if, I'm here. If selected, uh, which is is selected, so we'll, you'll be making a presentation, and Samir Ramadullah, you'll be making a presentation as well? Yes, I will be. Thank you, and uh, I'll check again, uh, folks in opposition, Ed de Guzman is here, Harvey Ford is here, uh, Sophie Melanchuk is here, and Ali Shivji. Okay, all of them are here, and uh, I'll go to administration for a presentation. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council. This application proposed to rezone a site in the McTaggart neighborhood from the RA7 low-rise apartment zone to the RA8 medium-rise apartment zone to allow for mid-rise multi-unit housing. To facilitate the rezoning, there is also an amendment to the McTaggart neighborhood area structure plan. Next slide, please. The site, measuring approximately 1.5 hectares, is located on the southern edge of the neighborhood. The site is surrounded by other low-rise apartments to the east and north. To the west is a commercial shopping center fronting on Rabbit Hill Road. The Antony Hende Drive and its transportation utility corridor are found immediately to the south of the site. The property is located in close proximity to a number of open spaces, including the White Mud Ravine and Constable Woodhall Park. 
It has good transportation connectivity from both a local and broader area perspective, with good access to Antony Hende, transit options, and bike routes throughout. Next slide, please. Access to the site is granted from Mullen Road to the north by way of assured use access easement with the abutting low-rise apartment, as shown on the top right photo on this slide. The proposed rezoning site is generally level and is currently vacant. Next slide, please. As part of the public engagement for this application, administration reached out using advance notices, the city's webpage and site signage. Three responses were received with concerns about the application, identifying potential issues with traffic, incompatibility of a mid-rise building to surrounding uses, and the opportunities for limited commercial uses that may impact the economic viability of surrounding commercial developments. Next slide, please. The RE7, Built form and the proposed RE8 zone have a similar built form. Both allow for multi-unit housing with ground level commercial opportunities, have identical uses and identical setback requirements. The key difference is the proposed RE8 zone are, are an additional floor area ratio and approximately two additional stories in height. The prescribed setbacks, landscaping requirements as per the zoning bylaw are expected to be adhered to, providing separation space and mitigating requirements between the site and the existing adjacent developments. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning aligns, aligns with the direction provided in the city plan as it enables ingoing residential density to occur at a variety of scales, densities, and designs within all parts of residential areas. To do this, th the application requires updates to the McTaggart Neighborhood Area Structure Plan map and the statistics by redesignating re the site as high density residential. The proposed bylaw also includes administrative updates to the NSP by incorporating row housing designations shown in pink, which may otherwise have been labeled incorrectly as medium density housing on the current development concept. The proposed rezoning and plan amendments result in a broader mixture of housing types and forms for the, for the neighborhood, while increasing the overall neighborhood density from 35.7 residential units per hectare to 39.2. Next slide, please. In summary, the administration supports this application because it diversifies housing types in the McTaggart neighborhood in a compatible way at an appropriate location near commercial opportunities and with good transportation accessibility. And the proposed rezoning increases residential density that is in alignment with compact growth within an existing neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. At this time, I will go to Alison Rosland to make a presentation. All right, good morning, Mr. Mayor and members of council. My name is Allison Roseland, and I'm speaking today about the application from Devereaux Developments and Takata to rezone their property in McTaggart from its current RA7 zone to the RA8 zone. Next slide. To start off, I will provide a brief overview of the property location and history. The property is located behind Optima Living's McTaggart Place Seniors Community with direct, direct access to Mullen Road via a panhandle strip of land. The subject lot on McTaggart and the McTaggart Place, McTaggart Place lot were previously one site owned by All Seniors Care, who we understand originally planned to do a multi-phase development here. The site was subdivided in 2015 and McTaggart Place was built on the front lot thereafter. In 2023, the front lot was sold to Optima Living and the rear lot was sold to Devereaux and Takeda. Of note, the two lots have common driveways on the east and west sides, and there was a restrictive covenant added to the subject lot in 2022 that prohibits seniors' facilities from being built. Next slide. In June, Situate submitted this application and created a web page to provide our contact information, post updates about the application, and answer commonly asked questions. Next slide. In addition to the city's notification process, we also mailed an information postcard to 369 nearby homes and businesses to let neighbors know about the project, the webpage, and again, to provide our contact information. This mail out is different from the city's mail out in that we send it to the municipal addresses in the area rather than to the registered owner on the land title. We heard from one resident who was concerned about the proposed rezoning and had questions about the public hearing process. We contacted the Twilliger Community League who acknowledged the notification but did not provide any feedback. In September, we also met with staff from our neighbors at McTaggart Place who had questions about traffic, building size and the potential impact on the safety of their residents. 
Devereaux will be the long-term owner of the site and they are committed to being a good neighbor and continuing conversations and engagement with McTaggart Place as this project progresses. Administration also shared with us concerns that they received regarding traffic and population impacts, compatibility with surrounding low-rise buildings, and viability of commercial uses. We will, uh, we will address these in our presentations today. Next slide. The four-story McTaggart Place is located to the northeast of the site. There is a commercial development to the west, four-story residential buildings to the east, and the Anthony Henday to the, site, to the south. The lot is also near green spaces, walking and biking routes, as well as transit, with several bus stops nearby on Mullen Road and Rabbit Hill, Rabbit Hill Road. Next slide. This slide shows that the area surrounding the lot is in the RA7 low-rise apartment and CSC shopping centre zones, which both allow for four-storey buildings. Rezoning the site to RA8 will allow for a maximum of six storeys, which is only an increase of two storeys compared to the surrounding area and is within the height allowed by the building code for wood frame buildings. Next slide. This slide compares the key regulations of the RA7 and RA8 zones. RA7 has the same front, rear, and side setbacks as RA8. The minimum side setback is three meters from the property line shared with McTaggart Place and the property lines shared with the low-rise residential to the east and commercial uses to the west. Of note, this site plan shows the minimum setback requ requirements, not a proposed building footprint. We are early in the design phase of the project, but is, it is expected that there would be more than one building. The current RA7 zone would allow for low-rise development up to four storeys. Rezoning to RA8 to allow six storeys is a modest increase in density compared to the build-out potentially currently or sorry, the build-out potential currently available under RA7. Next slide. The McTaggart Neighborhood Area Structure Plan was adopted in 2005 and aims to provide a diverse range of housing op options and concentrate population density near neighborhood commercial areas. The proposed rezoning requires an amendment to redesignate our lot from the medium density residential to the high density residential area. It is important to note that RA8 is typically used for mid-rise buildings, which are generally considered medium density. However, in the NASP and the terms of reference for NASP amendments, RA8 is classified as a high density zone. As a result, the proposed map change allows for the rezoning without redefining medium and high density residential areas throughout the, NS the NASP, which would have required significant changes to the plan. So to wrap up, I would like to respectfully ask for Council's support on this rezoning application, which will provide more housing diversity in McTaggart, where there is not currently mid-rise housing, contribute to housing affordability in a housing crunch, and align with city plan policy to add 50% of new housing units through infill citywide. Thank you so much for your time. Yep, perfect. And now we will go to the applicants in favor. And do you have any presentations? Yes, I do have a presentation. Okay. Um, what about Allison Roslin? Oh, Jesus. Sorry. Okay, please present, Some Mr. Ramtula. Great. Hello and good morning, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. My name is Samir Ramtula. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate and Project Development for Devereaux Developments, one of the companies that owns the site and is being considered for rezoning here today. I want to thank you for your time to hear my presentation and consideration on this application. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to give you a bit of background on our company, Devro is a purpose-built rental developer, property, asset manager, and long-term owner of all of our developments. We've developed over 3,700 units to date in the past 12 years across Western Canada and anticipate we'll reach around 6,500 in the next two years. Um, our focus has shifted to the Alberta markets uh, with over about 1,200 units expected to be occupied in Edmonton alone within the next two years. Uh, for this project, we've partnered with Takeda, the investment arm of a family-owned real estate company committed to delivering high-quality housing. Uh, they've been in business for 30 years, and you all will likely know them as Daytona Homes, City Homes, Carriage Signature Homes, and Axon Infills. Uh, we're currently planning for purpose-built rental housing on this site, and our target demographic is a mix of students, seniors who are looking to downsize, young professionals, and other Edmontonians that want to live close to amenities and transportation corridors. Uh, one thing to note that I alluded to before is that we own and operate all of our developments. Uh, what this does is it gives us the experience to understand our needs of our residents 
And we use that expertise for new projects to make sure that our developments are desirable and needs, uh, meets the needs for future residents. Uh, since we're in the rezoning stages, we are still early on the design process, but we would anticipate to have around two mid-rise residential buildings with some great amenities as we typically do, uh, which would include a pool, lounge, social room, a commercial grade fitness center, like the ones shown in the images uh, on the slide here. Uh, although both RA7 and RA8 zones allow for some commercial uses, uh, we're not really planning to provide any here, just given its accessibility through Mullen Road and the Panhandle. Um, our primary goal ultimately with the rezoning is to add a small amount of density to allow our site to be viable for a high quality amenity rich development. Um, through our engagement process, we do know that traffic parking have been a concern for the community members of the area. Uh, traffic to and from the site will be primarily for the business, the building residents and a minor increase from what's expected from the low rise development under the RA7 zone. During the application circulation process, the city transportation engineers also did not raise any concerns uh, that the proposal will have any adverse impacts to related to traffic. Furthermore, we're planning to provide on-site parking that's sufficient for our residents through a mix of surface and on the ground parking. And we'll use our knowledge for, uh, from parking trends from past projects to ensure that we meet the needs uh, from a parking perspective. Um, I also understand that there are sensitivities with uh, that are priority to our neighbors uh, to the north and in regards to how we can ensure the safety and security of their residents. My intent is to ultimately engage directly with their group through the DP and the detailed design to ensure that we could be a good neighbor and minimally impact their residential experience. Uh, given we have shared access point, we'll have to have that le level of discussion regardless. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I don't really need to speak much about the McTaggart area. We thoroughly are excited to be in the area and I think it's a beautiful area ultimately. The site has great access to commercial, just adjacent to it, to the Northwest of the site. And there's some really good uh, green spaces, including the White Mud Ravine Nature Reserve. Uh, that's only 250 meters away from the site. Uh, we think that providing mid-rise housing to the community will provide additional population to support these businesses and ultimately provide um, more housing diversity and co contribute to the community's vibrancy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the goals set out in the city plan are ultimately to provide opportunities to build different housing types that will give Edmontonians options in a great neighborhood like McTaggart. We want to be part of that process and provide housing that is designed and built well in Edmonton neighborhoods and help meet the growing demand of housing in the city. Next slide, please. As I finish my presentation, I just want to thank everybody and um, thank you all for your time to listen to our presentation here. And uh, I'm hopeful that with your support, we could build something great here on the site of McTaggart and provide additional housing options for the community that helps implement the city plan goals. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. And then we will go to questions of the applicants. I will go to Councillor Cartmel. Great, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, to either of you, I suppose, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, can you tell me what the uh, additional number of units will be through this rezoning, what it would be under RA7 and what it could be under RA8? Uh, Councillor Carmel, I, I can probably answer that. Uh, we believe we've obviously got to go through plannings because we've got our own internal targets to, uh, to get into the detailed design. I would anticipate we'd be around 30 to 30 to 35 more units. That would be just off the off the cuff answer. So 30 to 35 more. Um, how many in each do you know offhand? Um, in terms of the ratios? No, just the number of units, just generally. I, I know you have to do building design, so it's gonna be off a little bit, but mm -hmm. but ballpark, how many how many RE7 and how many RE8? Oh, total units for the area, you mean? Yeah, total units, yeah. Okay. Um I, I can I can get back to you on that, Councillor Cardinal. I don't think okay. I could answer that off the cuff just without looking at the detailed design of the site. Okay, if uh, I'm interested in that number, and then you said you're going to have some on-site parking, and I'm, uh, can you tell me what, uh, how much parking uh, for how many cars, or proportional to the number of units, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. So our our typical model, what we like to target, and for an area similar to this one that might have um, transportation, public transportation not fully developed yet. 
we'd anticipate we'd be around between 1.25 to 1.35 parking ratio per unit. And uh, just based on our experience and our history, we think that would be more than sufficient for this type of site. Right. So, so the number of parking spots on site would goes back to that number of how many units we finally get. So if you can get those numbers for me. Sure. Uh, Mr. Amtula. And then um, the RA8 is a generalized zone, so it allows for uh, mixed use, some commercial uses, but I understood you to say that there's no intent to put commercial uses on this site, uh, given the, the commercial stuff that's around the site. Um, if you did, what would those be? It would, is there anything, even with a, with a small chance of likelihood, that you would contemplate for a commercial operation? Um, I, I truly don't believe there's anything that would be viable. I think the biggest concern with commercial on a site like this is the access to public roadways. Um, obviously, cutting through an adjacent development, it just increases traffic and it doesn't get the eyes that it would need to attract a good tenant into the space. So our intent is really not to put any commercial at all. We don't we don't see it being viable uh, just based on the access to the site. It's really just a quirk of the zoning that you're applying for. The commercial is is considered or or correct. Less. correct. Have you had conversations with the neighboring properties around walkability and penetration from a walkability perspective? So will it be an opportunity, for, say, for the the homes that are to the east to uh, traverse the site for the commercial site to the west and, and provide a little bit of connectivity that way? You may not have had those conversations, but uh, wondering if you have. Allison, would you like to feel that or I can feel that? Uh, yeah, no, I can answer that. Um, uh, Councillor Cartmel, no, we haven't had those conversations yet just because we're early on in the design process. But I definitely think that's a consideration um, that we could look at going forward, um, just given the size of the site. Yeah, and I can probably just tag into that, that of course, there'll, be, there'll need to be that coordination also with our neighbours to the north because we do share two access roads. And so we just got to make sure that that can be effectively designed that benefits both parcels. Well, and perhaps, uh, you know, some pedestrian access mitigates the pressure on that access road. So uh, those are my questions for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Actually, very similar vein. Um, you know, we talk often about the opportunities for sort of this horizontal mixed use. Uh, so not everything has to kind of be stacked to, to be mixed use. But wondering what strategies you're going to take to connect to the existing commercial area to provide those pedestrian and, and cyclist connections. Thanks, Councillor Stevenson. So sort of kind of piggybacking off of our comment to Councillor Cartmel, um, I think just during the design phase, we'll have to have a broader conversation about like um, circulation on the site um, and identifying opportunities to connect to that commercial area. It is a little bit difficult because the buildings are quite large and long on that commercial site. And there's not generally a lot of connectivity there right now, but I think they'll have to be further pretty further exploration of that during the design process to see if there's ways to connect to that area without folks having to walk, you know, back out to the Mullen Road and then down and then over. Um, so it's definitely something we'll consider. Yeah, for sure. And I can probably just take yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, I could just take into that. That that's typically we've we've done a few of these developments where we abut directly to a commercial property. So yeah, our intent would definitely be able to contact those owners of that property and see what efficiencies can be done. Um, obviously, while we're in construction, we have trades there. So any simple adjustments to have some connectivity, that's easy for us to do, and it's a benefit for, for our tenants there as well. So we'll definitely be exploring that during the DP stages. Great. Thank you so much. And um, maybe I'll follow up with the administration as well, but to the best of your knowledge, there's no regulations in the zone that would prohibit or, or create barriers to creating that kind of connectivity. Councillor Stevenson, as far as I know, no. And I think just given the size of the site, as both Samir and I had mentioned this in our presentation, is there there likely be more than one building, right? So I think that also provides the opportunity to figure out how the circulation on the site um, occurs and then how it connects with the properties around it as well. Um, there's a little bit more flexibility when there's going to be more than one building. Great, excellent. Well, really pleased to hear that that's part of the, the thinking and planning that you're doing for the site. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, Councillor Tang. 
Great, thank you very much. Um, you know, of course, at this stage, you don't have a final design or, or, or bill form is necessary. Uh, it's, it's not part of the consideration, but I just want to confirm what I'm hearing, too, is that um, while RA7, you could go up to four, the intent is to go up to six, and hence the, the RA8 rezoning, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and I think, Allison, you said there will be one, more than one building. Um, do you have a sense of how many? Uh, we're still early, but probably two. Is that correct, Samir? I think as, yeah, yeah. as a potential plan right now, that's probably what will be expected. Okay. But again, we're still early. Yeah, fair in enough. That, in that planning process. So. Yeah, fair enough. That's a that's a big you know uh, caveat there for sure. Um, and so just back to that question about the total units, then we're kind of if you're looking at average thirty to thirty five more per building, then just double that. Would w would that be kind of fair to say? Uh, no, I, I would anticipate it would be closer to across the site. I'd, ha I'd have to do the density calculations. Okay. That's just typically what we would look at. You, you'd see that 30, 35 unit increase is what you would typically see on a site like this. Um, there, there's also so many different considerations. Obviously, you've got your building design. We like to have a bit of a higher parking ratio. So we would max out a density in most cases. We would try to keep it that would fit within ensuring that we can have an adequate parking ratio. So there's a bunch of different metrics that truly gets to what that density is. The goal is ultimately is what we can provide definitely fits within that RA8 zoning. When when we look at the RA7, we just can't make the site viable under that level of density because we like to provide that additional amenity space, the outdoor pools, and, and there's obviously cost to that. So we need the density to support providing those amenities to the tenants. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then that panhandle area, is that is that's the shared access road that you were talking about, correct? Correct, yes, there's a, there's a panhandle that's um, part of our property that's a shared access road, and then there's a, another smaller panhandle uh, that's a shared access road on the adjacent property as well that has access easements on there. And that's on the east side right. of the of the parcels. So those are the two, two entryway or two access to into the building itself? Correct. Yeah, into the property, yeah. Okay, yeah, and I think my colleagues had kind of ask some of the questions around pedestrian access and I imagine there's a further transportation analysis that you'll um, that you would do yeah for the as we get into the development permit stage everything becomes increasingly more detailed right so right. then we'll get into more analysis on access to the site what that looks like for the vehicles for pedestrians um, all of those things and then those just, details will start to be flushed out later on in the process right and then just one more thing um, just in terms of your conversations with neighbors um, you have you have done your own mail out and stuff and you've kind of You've gotten some feedback already. You know, there's some feedback already. I think we're going to hear and also include as part of the report, um, but just not a sort of a sit down direct conversations, but those engagements have been going on. Yeah, we did have a meeting with the uh, McTaggart place in September um, to talk about the rezoning and they shared some of their concerns um, with us then, which, uh, you, you know, one of their priorities, and, and I'm sure they might speak to this, is like the safety of their residents um, and, and traffic as well. So just given the unique configuration of the site, um, there'll be lots of ongoing conversations with them going forward, right? Um, and I think our client is in a good position with that because Devereaux intends to be the long-term, like they're going to be the long-term owner, right? Because they'll be operating the, um, the new um, housing buildings. Um, so, you know, throughout the development process, there'll, there'll definitely be ongoing communication with them as Great. well. Great, thank you. Uh, that, so that's it for me. Thank you. Any other questions from any of my council colleagues for the applicant at this time? Okay, we will move on to speakers in opposition. And I believe you're here in person, so the city clerk will be inviting you down to come speak.
And so for those online, we're just waiting for folks to, to in opposition to get seated uh, to, to hear their presentations. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so I will start with Ed de Guzman. You have five minutes uh, for your presentation. And, and please make sure just to turn on your microphone. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ed de Guzman and I'm the executive director at uh, McTaggart Place uh, Community, uh, an optimal living uh, community um, down on the McTaggart Place. So um, I'm here to represent um, our 186 residents um, in our community, uh, 120 staff, and of course their families. Um, I mean, we met with the um, the developer back in September 20, uh, 20th, and um, we appreciate that. I mean, they're, they they listen to our concerns. Um, but we want the uh, the council to hear our voice and um, maybe um, uh, consider our, our requests prior to um, um, getting this um, um, uh, change to R R A seven to R A eight uh, considered. So one of our main concerns, and I mean, at the end of the day. Um, I mean, it's my responsibility to make sure that our resident um, maintain their good quality of life, their safety, and uh, security. Um, I mean, their families entrusted us, and um, they've been with us, majority of them been with us since um, McTaggart Place opened in 2018. <laughs> um, I have uh, two of our residents here with us, um, representing the, the rest of the resident of McTaggart. And um, as I've said, uh, considering the, uh, the, um, the RA8 um, might bring a big impact to our resident quality of life, right? Um, the sun exposure will have a tremendous impact. I mean, that's their green space. Um, and I mean, they, they spend a lot of time um, behind our building um, and the, the, the new property development. Um, also, we catered for Alzheimer's dementia client in our building. So to date, we have, and, uh, we have 172, uh, pardon me, 72 resident with, um, from early stage to late stage of dementia. So the, um, the noise during the construction, and I mean, I know it will have a big impact as well. Um, of course, the, um, uh, the, the area where we have the, um, um, like the, 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 there's a, the walkway around the building and majority of our, our residents utilize that like three, four times a day or more. And that's their space. So, I mean, we're not totally opposing to the construction, right? Um, we want to maintain a good relationship with our neighbors and be a good neighbors to everyone. But we want the council to consider the safety and the security of our resident prior and or pre and post um, the building construction. Um, 
this will create more worries to our, our resident. And I mean, they've been coming to me, they've been coming to, um, to the owners of Optima Living, and um, one of them is here, Ali, uh, one of the principal. And um, I mean, it, it, it brings us uh, worries to, to everyone. Um, and, um, and of course, I mean, we have to, we have to reassure them that, I mean, we will have a good, um, we will have a good um, information to them prior to um, um, building construction and we will make sure that um, they have our words that um, living at McTaggart Place is still a safe place for them during and um, post-construction of the, uh, the facilities behind us. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And next we have uh, Mr. Harvey Ford. You have five minutes, please go ahead. I have to watch those lights, do I? Is that the procedure? Yes, if when it's yellow, green, yellow, and then it'll be red when you're out of time. Okay. No, I, I share it. I'm a resident of McTaggart. McTaggart is full of people in their 80s and 90s, many of them in poor health, a lot of them using walkers and wheelchairs, so I'm concerned with uh, the safety of my fellow residents. Uh, originally, just by way of a little history, and it was referred to by the developers, the two properties, the one that houses the retirement residents and the second one that now is being asked to be rezoned, were owned by a retirement company who set up McTaggart as a retirement residence and hoped to uh, build more retirement facilities on the, on the sort of backyard or back lot of the, of the area. Uh, they never accomplished that. McTaggart was sold to new ret retirement owners and the back property was sold to the developers. Now the whole, I think the people that are recommending council approve the rezoning, I'd like to know one thing, have they been out and looked at it? The access to the party, to the property you want to rezone is really access designed for retirement living, not access designed for other living. The problem being that the roads that run into the re new property you're talking about go right by the McTaggart. So all that traffic that's being generated by a new property will go by both sides of the McTaggart building on roads that really have no little or no use to McTaggart residents. So we're putting up with traffic and noise on roads that we don't care about. We don't use them very, very little on the roads and new development is coming in. The presentation today by the, I appreciate that there's gotta be something developed, but I was a little disappointed in the way they, we don't know the development, but I don't think you can go from an seven to eight, RA seven to RA eight, four to six stories and talk about minor differences. It's so up to 50% difference, if not more, depending on the building you build. So I hope city council takes that into account. We got a traffic problem, we worry about our safety, and we certainly don't need a lot of traffic running by. Somehow they've got to find better access. Got to check out, I don't know if they've looked at the roads that go in, are they suitable for the increased traffic? Also, I look around the area and it's RA7, I don't see any RA8 areas. I'd sure like to know where the closest RA8 zone is to our McTaggart place. Are we sort of guinea pigs or first RA8 in our area? I, I don't know, but it's, it's a little concerning and I think it'll be concerning for the residents and unless they can get better access into the to their property, it will be a problem for us. So uh, I'm hoping that council will seriously consider a request and make sure that 
all the details are there for improved access to the property. It will be developed. I appreciate that. It's sorry, seven is going to sit there. It won't sit there as a vacant field. No investor wants that. We understand that, but we certainly want to get good access to the property, and it's going to be difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. You did really good watching watching those lights. Um, Ms. Sophie Mel yeah, Mel Melchuk. Yeah. Good morning. Okay, I'm from McTaggart. We have 107, 183. Then we have the new Chinese home that's just going to open with 200. We have all these rise high risers in the thing. We have all commercial. Uh, Friesen Brothers, we have Rabbit Hill, we have all the restaurants. What's coming in there? Big trucks bringing in every day, every morning, these big trucks come in. These roads weren't even built for the big trucks. Now we have not only the big trucks, now we're going to have this place that's going to have teenagers, they're going to have all kinds of people, and where are they going to come? To me, the only access you have that's safe and so is to build a road from Rabbit Hill right direct so that the front of their building is facing Rabbit Hill Road and you have a parking lot there and there those little small roads that we have coming in do not take all that traffic especially all the big trucks that come in every day those are restaurants those are stores there's everything and that is not safe thank you thank you very much and uh, I will go to the next speaker, who also has five minutes, um, Mr. Ali Shivij. Shivji. Yes, Shivji, thank sorry, thank oh, you. No um, as I said, my name is Ali. Uh, I want to start with just saying that um, my grandmother had a horrible quality of life. Uh, in the last chapter of her life, um, she was not only strapped to her bed in a locked unit, but um, she had no ability to input on the environment that she was going to live in the activities that she had in her final chapter of her life, or really the, the interaction with her and her family or her neighbors. And so as a result, I mean, I, I've dedicated my life to saying, how do I promote, protect, advocate, advocate the quality of life and for the quality of life of residents? And fortunately within our company, we have 4,000 of them across 40 sites in Western Canada. And so we often want to look at ways that we can be great neighbors, that we can be ultimately um, looking after the interests of all the stakeholders. But most importantly, we're here to make sure that the lives of our residents are the best quality of life that they can ever have. Now, I'm also a businessman. I'm a born and bred Albertan. Um, I'm a community builder, and, and I'm passionate about making sure that we can build great and amazing communities. And it's interesting because you have to register if you're for or against something, and, and I'm not either. I'm, I'm here to say, how could we do this in a way where we can do it, but we can do it well? And I think that's not necessarily for or against, it's kind of in the middle. Um, so one, a couple of things that have happened so far that it's important just to set the context. In terms of public consultation, um, it looks like many methods were followed, which I think is wonderful. Um, but the fact that you have 186 citizens that live right next to a development and not a single one of them got a card in advance of the September 20th deadline seems like a bit weird. Now, maybe there's something there that happened or whatever, but it, thankfully we were able to reach out, we were able to have some conversation with, with the developers, but, but not in a way that actually engaged the actual residents. And yet they can be full of amazing and great ideas and something that we have to think about. Two, there are two access roads on this property. Now, no matter how I look at it, it's hard to really imagine what's north, east, west, south, but effectively the, the designated access road that, um, that is part of this, um, which is shared property, uh, is actually also the area that all of our deliveries come through. It's also where um, our memory care residents live on that particular side. So not only is that road blocked at least two or three times a day by large trucks that, that have no choice but when they're backing in to actually block off that entire access road, um, but also we have many residents that walk on the sidewalk path as well as those who live right in those, those areas right there. That isn't the case for the other access part on the other side of the building. Now, we own that access part on the si other side of the building, um, and we're more than willing to have conversations about how to switch things and, and think about it and be creative. But one of those things when you think about consultation is they probably would have figured that out if they were, if they were talking or thinking through that part. 
Um, the second thing is when we look at um, our residents, we have many residents that are able-bodied and do walk across exactly where that access point is to go to the commercial areas, to go across there. And there's a pretty tight turning when, when people uh, turn into the property. And I just, I don't want a resident getting hit by a car to be on any of our, um, you know, on our things when we think through that. And it's an active walkway on a regular basis. And third, um, when we think a little bit about the sunshine, um, I, I'm, I'm very, very thankful to Sophie and Arby who came and uh, were able to be here by nine o'clock. Most of our residents like to sleep in a little bit. And when they really enjoy the sun is in the afternoon. And the way that this site is positioned, um, the sun falls on the back of the building where, as Ed was talking about our green space, they do have a, a green space within our property line. Um, but all that green space is going to be overshadowed if you have a building that's now six stories when ours is only four. And so thinking a little bit about the quality of life of our residents, thinking a little bit about the noise that will affect our memory care residents coming on that side and thinking about the safety are all things that we really wanna be concerned about and think about how can we be helpful. Now, um, we wanna be good neighbors. We wanna support development. We wanna think about um, how can we find solutions. And look, there is an incredible and magical opportunity to create an intergenerational development here that truly takes into account you know, kids, adults, seniors, and others, and actually think about interesting areas. We talked about commercial spaces. Well, there's no daycare within like at least a five or 10 minute drive of this area. We have 120 people that work for us. We probably have another 150 people that work around the area. Uh, you know, things like that that I think we can really think about. I think we need to change and look at the access road and see if we can use the other access road on other part of the building. And again, happy to have that conversation because we own it. And second, we need to look at, third, we need to look at buffering properly, both in terms of trees, in terms of fencing, otherwise just to make sure that again, resident access and seniors and our beloved elders who are walking through there are just safe. So with that, again, it's not that we're for or against. We wanna be good neighbors. We just wanna do it in a, uh, in a proper way. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And now we will have, I will call for council members with questions to members in opposition. So I will start with Councillor Cartmel. Great, thank you. Um, I'll direct my questions to uh, Mr. Shivji to start. Am I saying your name correctly, sir? I wanna make that sure Yes, that. yes. Okay, thank you. So I wanna pick up on one of your final comments about um, you know intergenerational living. And I guess uh, hearing what was offered earlier that there is uh, roughly one third of your residents uh, are um, suffered from conditions that are cognitive and, and related to Alzheimer's and those kinds of things. I, I wonder how many challenges you run into with the families uh, of those that you're serving uh, in, uh, in terms of being able to live nearby or you know travel distances or time to get to this facility. I guess, in other words, is there, would this development present an opportunity for some of those families to perhaps live closer by or, or spouses or partners to live closer by to the facility that you're operating? I think, sorry, I don't know where to look, but I'm going to look up at that screen, so hopefully that, that's okay. But I, I think, um, yeah, absolutely. There, there's ways that you can look at that. I mean, there's obviously a lot of density around this building, but it doesn't escape the ability to have more, uh, not at all. I, I think there could be some great synergies there. And I wonder, so there was also conversations around um, that a number of your residents like to walk around the building, uh, and, and perhaps this is seen as a potential impediment to that. Uh, if we can create a walkability that incorporates several properties together, would that be of, you know, do you think that would be of value? And I'm wondering if, uh, and I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, Mr. Amtula, but if there is a central courtyard kind of a space that is built as part of this development, and that was co-joined to the back door of your development, perhaps that offers a, a bit of a garden space. Uh, I'm looking at the back side of the Friesen brothers, and I know that they were, uh, asked to enhance that backside and, and plant a lot of trees and provide a sidewalk there, which is there. So, I mean, if we could pull some of those pieces together, is, is there a possibility that uh, through development of this site, we create a more walkable and a more appealing neighborhood generally, not just for your facility, but for several facilities? Look, I, I mean, I think uh, it's a leading question, but one that I completely agree with. And I think I'm sure Allison and Samir and the others would all agree with that as well. Now, I'd love for Samir to build like a Nordic spa there as well. But given that we're in Edmonton, that probably won't be the case. But I, I do think that, look, a, a walkable area and, and truly consulting and engaging in a way that's collaborative can create something really magical there for sure. And I think that we have all the all the seeds are here, but we haven't sown them yet properly. And I just want to make sure we do before we 
we just blanket put up a you know zoning that doesn't necessarily require anyone to uh, to then really be consultative. Did you? Um, I, I heard mention earlier that there was a conversation with uh, Mr. M. Tula and his company and and uh, Ms. Roslin, I believe. Uh, was it just one meeting? Was it a series of meetings? Did you have you had a series of conversations or just the one? Yeah, look, there was a there was one meeting. Um, it was actually at our request um, by reaching out to the town planner and then reaching out for them to put us in touch, um, as there wasn't really any direct uh, way of doing so by way of the cards or otherwise. Um, I believe that overall, uh, the feeling that our our team got was that while there was a lot of a lot of um, well, I mean, Ed's here, so I'll speak briefly. And Ed, please jump in because Ed was present. I wasn't, but the the, the sense that they got was. It's great to hear your concerns. Uh, we'll be in touch, but not hey, let's actually think about this in a way that makes sense. And and I think the obvious one for us was just this access road. I mean, right. if, you know, so we have to think creatively about this and, and have the right people there. But Ed, was there any any other feelings you had or any feedback you had from the meeting with uh, with them that you wanted to share? Uh, one of our, our main concerns, and this is brought to us by our resident, is the um, the community engagement. Um, I didn't. I, I made an effort to um, reach out to the city and uh, organize this meeting to meet with uh, Alison and her team, and uh, but we never get any um, any notification or anything from from the developer um, up until uh, September 20th when Marty sent us the uh, uh, the invites. Mr. De Guzman, is your property um, is it a strata property? Does each uh, resident own their unit discreetly, or is there, is there one owner for the property and everybody I, is it? I can own. That. I can answer that. Sorry, there's one owner and it's a rental building. Right. Okay. So it's likely one card went to the building. Well, well except that right. I think Allison was really clear that they sent it to the municipal addresses as opposed to the ownership, which is why we have right. 186 municipal addresses within our building. Fair enough. So I'll, I'll ask that question. Uh, my time is up. I may come around again. Thank you for your uh, for the for the answers. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I am going to move on to Councillor Tang for your questions. Great. I'm just going to ignore that for right now. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for taking taking the time out of your day and to come all the way to City Hall and speak. So really appreciate, um, you know, your your engagement in this. Uh, maybe I'll start with Ed. Um, if you can clarify a little bit, you say that a lot of the residents really enjoy spending time outside in the green space. Are you talking about the lot that we're talking about right now? Uh, is that a is that the current space? Uh, is that the green space that you're talking about? Um, yes, but we do have um, um, like our own space um, in the backyard between the uh, the property line between McTaggart and uh, the new developer or the new development area. Um, and like oh, what um, Ali was saying, if we approve the R8, um, the RA8, um, it will block the uh, the area. I see. You're, yeah. you're talking about that strip between your property and and the property that we're talking about. That is that correct. Strip. And with a higher stories, it might block the some of the sunlight. So that may be some questions I might ask for administration around sunlight and shading studies. Sure, Sophie, go ahead. In the McTaggart area all over, we have, of course, Rabbit Hill Road. We have all of our places, and basically they are four stories. Now, there's only, as far as I understand, there's only two empty lots. That's the one that we're working at right now, and I think there's another one across from the Chinese place. So that would be two spots to sell. Anyway, so why can't we keep the whole area uniform instead of having somebody sticking up up, up in the air? Yeah, okay. And I making it all yeah, I appreciate your that would just be a beautiful area. I, I appreciate uniform. your point about wanting to stay at RA seven. Uh, maybe I'll stick with you for a second. So um, so you mentioned there's a Chinese seniors retirement. Also like where is that? How far away is that to McTag McTaggart Place? Sophie, do you know? I think uh, the Chinese one. Yeah. Yeah, it's right around the corner. Yeah, it's a it's a block away from our facilities on the um, um, east side, and um, they they're also like an R eight R uh, R A seven. Sure. Uh, four story uh, building. Right, and what I also heard you say was, with a lot of the commercial malls in the area, there's a lot of restaurants, 
a lot of the delivery trucks will be driving around, not necessarily through your access roads, because I don't know where they would go, but just the traffic in the area, including traffic going to the Chinese seniors retirement home is creating the noise and inconvenience that affects your quality of life. Is that right, Sophie? Well, you have mentioned that you're worried about trucks driving around from all these places. Of course, first of all, those roads weren't built for the big, big trucks, but you're going to bring in construction. Where are they going to come in? Where are all those great big machines going to come in? In what area? It, it's, and you're going to start, uh, I mean, and then who's going, where are all these construction workers going to park? I, they should take a bus every morning and then they won't have to worry about a parking spot. So but as far as the area is concerned, when they were building the Chinese place, they, all these little people that come to work have to come to work with a truck or the car parked all over the place. And so I now imagine when they're going to start constructing this one, we'll have the same problem. And um, I imagine when, when McTaggart Place was under construction, you, other neighbors probably experienced similar things, right? Yeah. Um, so it sounds like it, you're, you're concerned about how the construction might affect your quality of life. And then I guess back to Ed for a second, you talked a lot about safety. Can you just clarify for me exactly what the safety you're talking about? Are we talking about traffic safety, pedestrian safety? Are we talking about worries about social disorder, sorry, social disorder, um, sort of, you know, different kinds of people living in this new building and kind of the impact it might have among residents? So safety, like um, as I mentioned, I mean, there's a, a walking trail around the building and this walking trail use, uses a lot, um, like from day to day, living up our resident. Um, so that's one thing. And, and also they enjoy the, uh, the amenities um, beside our building, like um, the restaurant, um, the bank access, the coffee shop, um, they enjoy going to that um, access. And that's on the uh, east side of um, McTaggart Place where this is the proposed um, access to the new development uh, behind uh, McTaggart Place. So they they cross on that street all the time, right? Right, um, so you are quite worried about sort of like pedestrian access, traffic safety. And, that is correct. Um, well, I'm out of time, but I also, I think I heard there's some responses earlier around creating better access for that. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think Councillor Tang asked a number of my questions, so I'll probably be brief. Uh, but I'm just wondering, you know, traffic safety and safety of pedestrians has come up a few times. Uh, I'm wondering, is that a, a already uh, an issue in the area, or is it sort of an anticipated issue? Are you already experiencing some of those pressures today around traffic safety? Uh, the traffic safety is not a big concern at, at the moment. Uh, I mean, there's some, some days, um, especially when um, um, you're going west, turning left on Rabbit Hill. And um, I mean, open times, um, you will see uh, like a, a, a lined up traffic um, because of the, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the access. I mean, it's only, it's only one way on each direction. So you can see like traffic. So, I mean, again, our main concern is what more if, like, this development uh, go through and um, it right. will create more traffic. Okay, okay, that's, that's helpful. Um, and the reason I was asking, I mean, the, tr the city has a number of tools in its, its tool belt if there are issues with, um, I guess, pedestrian safety and safe mobility. Uh, and I can, I can ask some of those through administration, like if, you know, if it, if it were to move forward and you did notice um, additional issues and, and flags around pedestrian safety, um, I wonder if there might be opportunities to um, to directly address those through through some other tools. So I can Sorry, come back to I, that with administration. But if I can oh, just add on ahead. that one, yep. I think the biggest um, safety concern is basically as traffic starts to come into our property line. Because mm -hmm. once you turn in, the, everyone walks across what is right now the access road right. to be able to access any of the other McTaggart kind of community spaces. So I think that's when the biggest concern would be is right. once people enter the property line. Right. Okay. That's helpful clarification. Thank you for that. Um, and then maybe a slightly broader question. So uh, whenever these types of rezonings come forward, I always like to think about current state um, as an RA7, you know, if that is allowed, 
right now, something could be, you know, theoretically moving forward immediately as an RA7. Um, and I, I can understand uh, some of the, the concerns around loss of sunlight that might come with a uh, slightly higher building going from four stories to six. Um, concerns around the access road, the concerns around the, the pedestrian safety that you just outlined, um, concerns around engagement, the nuisance construction, uh, would those still be present, those concerns still be present with an RA7 building? Yes, but I think if you're if you're looking back at the historical parts of the building, you have to remember that when it was all designated RA7, it was designated as a single owner. And so from that perspective, when they were even thinking about the traffic studies, they were looking at both access roads, both ways to engage the start, side of the back, and there would be things there. Now, I understand what happens when you subdivide, et cetera, but to look at it at a point like that with, with a single access road is where the points start to get more difficult. I think construction is construction. We have to deal with it and go forward. But I think it's it's how we access that site and how we think about it that is really the biggest part we've got to think through. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And Councillor Salvador, would you be willing oh, to? Oh, yes. I'll move a second round. Second. Okay. Moved by Councillor Salvador, seconded by Councillor uh, Knack for a second round. Please vote. Councillor Paquette, we're just waiting on one vote from you. My apologies, I'm trying to get this to work. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Councillor Cartmill. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll again address my questions to Mr. Shivji, but feel free to pass them to uh, whomever. And uh, and I don't mean to uh, ignore Ms. Melichuk or Mr. Ford. Um, I'm happy to have uh, further conversation with uh, the residents as things proceed here. So, uh, but we're just in the interest of time. Some of the things I'm going to ask the proponent, uh, Mr. Amtula and Ms. Rosalind, are things like this. Uh, I understand that one road is uh, somewhat adjacent to. Um, the suites in which uh, the uh, Alzheimer and dementia residents live. So if the primary route was on the other side, would that be helpful? Is there, you know, designating things that way? And we're getting into the details, but are solutions like that palatable to you from a traffic perspective? So are you asking me or Mr. Ramtula? I'm asking you, um, I can't ask Mr. Ramtula. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I mean, I think, I guess we have to look at it properly, but I, but absolutely, I, I think we would be open to how we think through that for sure. And if we manage speed uh, with things like raised sidewalks and speed bumps on those access roads, I mean, that would, to my mind anyway, augment uh, some of the safety concerns, yes? Yes, agreed. Uh, and then I'm looking at, again, you know, the, property, the commercial property to the east. And I'm not sure, so I just want to be clear, I, you know, with this zoning application, we're talking about the use of land and the other things that we're talking around it are things that we can have further discussion about or negotiate with other landowners with. But if we were able to gain some uh, access through the commercial development to the east to take pressure off of those two access roads, that too would be uh, met with uh, happiness, yes? Yeah, I think it would be good for all parties because then people could actually access all of those commercial spaces without having to drive around, come back and go through for sure. We have two conditions to sort of consider. One is, you know, what happens when this development is finally built? And uh, the other is how we build it. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest, uh, and I don't know if this is feasible, but there is a construction road that led to the Henday right of way when they're building some pipeline work there. And I'm going to see if we can't use that as a construction access to the south side of the site that might mitigate some of the traffic concerns during construction that your residents are fearful of. Again, just uh, wondering if that would have your approval. What I'm trying to do, sir, is avoid subsequent rounds of questions this afternoon to come and ask you these questions again. So on the supposition that this meets with the support of uh, Mr. Antula, would you be supportive of those kinds of things? Yes. Sophie's kicking me under the chair saying yes, so uh, I will answer that as well. That yes, uh, I think that would yeah. be favorable. And on, so just to be clear, the province controls that piece of property. So I'm not sure if any of these things are doable, but there are no, things no. that we can perhaps take away as part of a community conversation at the next step and see if we can't get to some agreement on those pieces. So I, I offer you the promise to try, but yeah, can't look, quite I, offer you 
the promise to deliver. Absolutely, no, I appreciate it. Look, I think the, the opportunity is to build a, a beautiful intergenerational community or have a bunch of neighboring areas with, with uh, you know, uh, property lines and, and people kind of barely talking to each other. So hopefully we do the former. Right, I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much, all of you, for uh, making your way down to City Hall today. I really appreciate it and uh, really appreciate you sharing your comments with Council. That's all for me, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kurtmel. And so any uh, questions, just last call for questions from Council colleagues uh, for those in opposition. Okay, so we will move to questions of administration. Does anyone on council have questions to administration? I'm 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 guessing Councillor Cartmel that you are you do not have questions for administration? No, Councillor Rutherford. I have uh, further questions for the proponent, but not from administration. I think I know where they stand. Okay. Uh, I do see Councillor Tang on the board, so I will start with Councillor Tang. Great, thank you. Um, I guess, can you just walk me through a little bit of any kind of shading study that was done and poten potential shading that might uh, impact the space that the, the residents were talking about? Uh, Councillor Tang, with, with standard zoning, we typically of this RA8, we don't ask for shading studies. We look at that more at uh, time of development permit. Okay, so it will be done. Yeah, yeah I, w I would note that um, the, the property to the north, the existing property, has about a 10 plus meter rear yard already. Um, I think the applicant has heard what's been said today and in our discussions with them, we've said it would probably be in everybody's best interest if they could move their building a little further back mm -hmm. and look at a better interaction. Um, just the angle of the buildings as well, I think there's the, given the commercial side to the west is, is, is fairly low pretty low height, um, there will still be good solar penetration into the, um, into the building to the north, the existing one. Right. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's the details at time of development permit. Absolutely, and so maybe just for those, um, you know, typically at the rezoning, we, we're not quite far enough um, along the way around the design to kind of get those details, but I think the feedback here, I think just exactly as Mr. Ford said, it will be helpful to inform that next stage. And then I was curious about one thing that was mentioned earlier, and I'm just wondering if there's a, a, any additional context. Why is there an RC in 2022? Is that something that the property owner would, drove to put that on? Um, to prevent future senior living being built there? Okay. Most likely, yes. We're, we're not party to that. Oh, I'm, we're not. I'm not okay. aware of it. No. I, can I? I think I can answer that. Oh, unfortunately, um, <laughs> we're not uh, asking questions, but we could come back after. But yeah, anyways. we will. The process is that we circle back. So if there's any further questions or comments that arise from inform new information, uh, we do have the process right now. It's simply to administration. Then we'll go back to the applicant and and back after that. So that's the, it's a very regimented process for for public hearing that we follow. I'm done. That's all. Thank you. Great. And I am not seeing any further questions to administration. I do know that Councillor Cartmel did mention he had questions to the applicant. So I will uh, open it up to any. Uh, further clarifying questions to the applicant arising from new information. And, and please go ahead, Councillor Carmel. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ramtula, what say you about the restrictive covenant, first of all? Um, yeah, I can't, I can't really speak to it because we, we purchased nope. it after the fact, but I can definitely, it's, it's a difficult process to kind of, uh, I've seen other developments try to turn off competition to get onto the lands. And so I think that's something that the previous owners might have looked into. So Mr. Antula, there's uh, things that uh, you can control on your side as it's developed. Uh, things like uh, you know, pushing your green space to the space adjoining uh, the optimal property, uh, managing accesses so that one's the primary, one's the secondary, perhaps augmenting those accesses with speed controls and, and uh, traffic calming measures. Um, uh, are you willing to share on all of those things? Yeah, for sure. We definitely consider all those options. I, I know in our preliminary looks at the site, that was originally really going to be our intent. And regardless if it falls on a separate property on our property, we, as soon as somebody enters into our property line, we face the same issues. So we're constantly looking at that for sure. 
this is going to sound a little silly, I suppose, but one of the things I encountered with a couple of the senior centers I was involved with was building an observation deck, perhaps on their side of the property line, but looking into the, you know, the vista, the great big hole and the building as it arises. Are you willing to sort of make a bit of a, a safe observation area so that people can watch things come up as they come up and, uh, you know, it speaks to a bit of an engagement process? Yeah, like I, I, I'm more than happy to, during construction either way, I, I always love to have engagement. I'm more than happy to kind of explain what's going on on the site, explain to the to the residents what's kind of, what's happening on our site. I'm more than happy to do that. Obviously with it being a construction zone, we have to ensure that we have the protection and safety for everybody. But uh, if, if there was something that the neighbors wanted to look at in, in conjunction with us, more than happy to explore all options. Can we stretch that to include things like when you, when you do get into some of the preliminary design of where the structures will be, how high they are, some, uh, some sun shadow studies, uh, perhaps some early landscaping discussions about, you know, what the, what it's going to look like, both people coming to and through the site is, uh, and I wonder about even going so far as to establishing a bit of a community committee that talks about the development as it comes up that might involve the adjacent property owners or representatives thereof. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, of course, I'm, I'm generally supportive of all all avenues. I think for me, it, it's the similar concerns that they might see on their lands. Of course, we're the new ones there, but when we do our site design, we're looking at the same kinds of concerns. So there's definitely got to be some collaboration and cohesion when we look at our site design to ensure we have adequate buffers. We can we can make sure that there's a clean split between the two properties. It doesn't make sense for me to have a, a tower sitting right on that property line that loses views on one side. So there, these are all conversations that I look at on the design side of things as well. So for sure, I'm more than happy to have these conversations. I, I always have to look at the economic viability to make sure that the site works and we can we can put a, put a business case to the site, but for sure, I'm always, always happy to have these conversations. And I, you know, things we can't control today, but willing to have a conversation with uh, some of the adjacent property owners in terms of potential construction accesses or permanent uh, access to the properties, those kinds of things. Yeah, for sure. I think I think uh, 100% more than happy to look at those uh, those exercises. I would to your, to your recommendation if there's a way to get in a construction access to the south, I would love that. <laughs> that would be very welcome. So I'm more than happy to engage in that process and see what we can do with it. And you're not going to mind too much if I remind you and kind of hold you to the to the word that uh, you've been speaking speaking today. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, and then circling back to my earlier questions of you, sir. Um, do you have some numbers for me, numbers of units and numbers of parking spots? Yeah, so I looked at it on some of our previous high-level planning. Very high, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, very high-level planning here. And I've gotten, I'm just going to get it exactly, but it was, I had a difference between the two sites. It was around 45 units. And I was looking at uh, my earlier iteration to my final iteration, I've got about 1.31 parking ratio. So that's around 246 stalls, 246 to 256 stalls. So I've, I've got basically that that's a differentiation between the two options right now. But so roughly, roughly potentially 250 stalls and roughly potentially I'm trying to do quick math, 160 units. Yes. I, I'm a closer, maybe it'll be closer to 180 to 200 180. units. And I'm not holding to those numbers specifically, but order of magnitude, that's what we're looking yeah. for. Order of magnitude, yeah. If you compare it to the actual RA7, RA zoning, we're, we're much below that what that maximum density would ever get to because of our parking ratios. Okay. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Any other further questions to the applicant? Okay, I will go back to um, any further questions to the speakers in opposition arising from new information. And Councillor Cartmel, I can't tell if you're on the board from before or not. I'm sorry, Councillor Rutherford, I sort of jumped the gun. I have no further questions for those in opposition. I was just getting ready to move closure of the hearing. Okay, perfect. So because there's no more questions, um, I will just jump on the board and just let you uh, answer the one question that you wanted to ask. So what was your answer to the, the question from previous? Sure, the question I believe was, why was there a restricted covenant on, on the property? And if I'm not mistaken, it was a condition of sale. So when we um, when we were buying the uh, the all senior scare, so the building McTaggart place itself, um, there was, it was a contiguous piece of land, they then subdivided it 
and um, and as part of the sale, we asked that there would be no competing residences if there was going to be a land behind it. And so in order for the sale to go through, it was part of the sale uh, process that that had to be put on title um, because we didn't want to compromise the uh, the retirement residence. That's, that's understandable. Thank you so much. That's all my questions, and I don't see any further questions, so I will go to Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. I'll move closure of the public hearing on items 3.9 and 3.10. Second. So that's moved by Councillor Cartmel, seconded by Councillor Knack. Can we please vote on closure of the public hearing on item 3.9 and 3.10? We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Councillor Rutherford, I'll move first reading of item 3.9 and 3.10 and speak to it. Please. Second. So again, moved by Councillor Cartmel and mm -hmm. seconded by Councillor Knack. And we'll, this is the opportunity for anybody that wants to speak to this item. I do recognize we are close to noon, but it would be, you know, if it's the desire of council, I would like to, finish this item in respect of the public's uh, attendance so they do not have to wait to come back. Uh, so we will go to speakers on this item. So please go ahead, Councillor Tang, I see you're up on the board. Yeah, I'll, in the interest of time, let's keep it really quick. I think there's a number of concerns raised, but I also heard that, um, you know, I think whether it's through the design or uh, discussion between uh, the developer and the neighbors, um, I think a number of those concerns can be mitigated through whether it's pedestrian access, better road access, or kind of the, you know, the, the final bill form and uh, like angling of the building that can mitigate some of the shading concerns. Um, and whether it's RA7 or RAA, as my council colleague pointed out, there will come with some kind of uh, noise disruption because of the construction. But I do hope that one day when the new residents move into this location, they will also enjoy the same quality of life that many of your residents are enjoying, um, as it is clearly, you know, there's drawing some of those um, future residents, right? Um, so anyways, for that, I am happy to support this, and um, I appreciate the war counselor and um, the, the line of questioning to, to the applicant as well for, for that accountability. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And I will go to Councillor Cartmel. Would you like to close? I would indeed. Uh, so again, thanks uh, very much to those that came down to uh, City Hall to speak and to uh, express those concerns. Uh, my apologies for not being there in person. Uh, I had reached out to McTaggart Place uh, and asked if there were any concerns about this and, and uh, I, I did not receive uh, any responses. So I did not, I did not anticipate this conversation today. So. My sincere apologies for not uh, being there in person. Uh, we are talking today about what the best use of the land is. And uh, there's no question that uh, adding two stories to the potential uh, building that might be built on the site means that we might block a little bit more sunlight and we're gonna have more units and more cars that we might otherwise have anticipated. And uh, you know that's, that is to some degree on the downside of what this development might bring. What it does bring though, is I think uh, a number of opportunities. And the first opportunity was the opportunity to have this conversation today, to have a, a public forum we, where uh, there was an airing of uh, concerns and uh, responses from the proponent. And so you heard me say just a moment ago that uh, it's my intent to hold Mr. Remtula to his pledges, uh, to make sure that this, this development complements everything around it. Uh, and enhances uh, the experience of the people that are living in uh, McTaggart Place as opposed to uh, lessening that experience. So I, uh, I firmly intend to do that. Uh, I hope that we can explore uh, some connectivity and some, uh, call it some compromise, some uh, pathways through the adjoining properties so that we make this uh, a very walkable community and collection of, of buildings and developments uh, and not discrete developments that are bounded by fences and don't allow that permeability and that that movement through. Uh, I've made lists of all of the concerns that I've heard around construction noise and and uh, traffic uh, and about permanent traffic, accessibility, uh, those kinds of things. And uh, so uh, I've got a few ideas uh, and I'm sure that you have a few ideas. So again, I look forward to that first conversation that we can have as a collective community to move forward to 
ensure that this design is going to really be the thing that uh, that suits everybody. And finally, I want to go back to the comment that uh, Mr. Shivji offered in his first speaking notes, and that is the idea of a of a uh, you know essentially a campus uh, where we have a number of people that can live uh, and share their experiences in this place, and potentially as their needs for supports uh, for care. Uh, change, they can find their way from one of these buildings to another. And even though they may be owned by different people and managed by different organizations, that we begin to get a, uh, a, a bit of a village here where people can move through this space uh, and, and enjoy the opportunities that a, a variety of living experiences and a variety of living uh, conditions can offer. Uh, we didn't talk about what the, the general vicinity has to offer. There's a, a number of parks not very far away. It's very close to the ravine for those that can walk a little farther. There's a school just down the road, uh, which is going to offer opportunities for uh, families to get into the neighborhood, uh, you know, as a first step, perhaps. Uh, there's a lot to offer here. And there's a real opportunity to make this a bit of a model for what we can do when we talk about uh, multi-unit residential infill developments in established neighborhoods. So uh, I know that I'm excited about seizing that opportunity and, and making this a model, making this uh, the positive model that we're all seeking. Uh, and while we have concerns, making sure that those concerns are heard and addressed. So uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, I encourage my colleagues to support this application and look forward to our future conversations in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. So I will call the vote. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Councilor Rutherford, I'll move second reading of items 3.9, 3.10. Second. Seconded by Councilor Knack. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Councillor Rutherford, I will move consideration of third reading of items 3.9 and 3.10. Second. So seconded by Councillor Knack. This is consideration for third reading. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Councillor Rutherford, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw. 20607 and Charter Bylaw 20608. Second. Seconded by Councillor Knack. Please vote. Do we have all the votes? We, ha we have all the votes now. Please display the votes. And that is carried. We are on recess now until 1.30. See you back at 1.30. Thank you.
Good afternoon. We are live from Chamber. Good afternoon and, and welcome back. I understand we have quorum, but let's just do a roll call to, to double check. So, Councillor Wright, are you with us? Good afternoon. Councillor Knack? Good afternoon. Councillor Principe? Hello. Councillor Stevenson? Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette? Councillor Paquette? Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Councillor Tang? Here. We know Amarji. Uh, Council, the mayor is away for uh, for a little bit here. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Okay. Uh, so we do have quorum at this point, so we will move on to item 3.1, which was selected by Councillor Principe, and we will, uh, I guess, ask if you want a presentation from administration. Yes, please. Okay, we'll start with a presentation from administration. Good afternoon. That was to buy me time to scroll up. Um, the application is to rezone a portion of the site in the Cristalina Nera East neighborhood from the RF5 or row housing zone to the RA7 or low rise apartment zone. The proposed RA7 zone would allow for a multi-unit housing up to 16 meters in height and approximately four stories. Next slide, please. Located at the edge of the neighborhood on the corner of 178th Avenue and 69A Street, the site is currently surrounded by roadways on two sides and as per the current plan of subdivision, the site will also be flanking the future 176A Avenue to the south. The site is, is an excellent location for increased density due to its quick access to bus service along McConaughey Boulevard, 178th Avenue, 66th Street, and 69A Street, which is designated Future Transit Corridor, all within a five minute walk. Next slide, please. Administration reached out using advance notice and information on the city's website. We heard concerns from the adjacent property owners around potential parking and traffic congestion, reduced property values and privacy, sun shadowing, overcrowding, noise pollution, and endangering the ecosystem. Next slide, please. The key difference between the existing RF5 zone and the proposed RA7 zone is that the RA7 zone allows for increased density, building height, and limited commercial opportunities at ground level. The site location and similar land uses on adjacent site to the east will help to reduce the impact to the proposed development. Next slide, please. The site is located within the Cristalina Nera East neighborhood structure plan and is designated as medium density resi residential, which allows for low rise development. This application also aligns with the city plan direction by encouraging diverse development in the neighborhood, providing a variety of housing options. Next slide, please. In summary, administration is in support of this application because it provides the opportunity for an increase in density and housing diversity. It aligns with Cristalina Nera East Neighborhood Structure Plan and it proposes a built form that is compatible with the surrounding land uses. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I will now go to uh, speakers in uh, favor. I know they're, they're here for questions only. Let's just confirm that we have Bladen Dib. Dibbin, are yes, you here? Hello. And Lewis Donnan? Lewis Donnan? Okay, well, we will just go to questions of, the, uh, if there are any questions from council members to the applicant, uh, this would be your time to sign up. Councillor Principe? Thank you, Chair Rutherford. Uh, Mr. Dibbin, I do have a question uh, in regards to this new rezoning. So this land was just rezoned, I believe, in June of 2022, correct? Yes, Councillor, that's correct. Okay, so um, why, why are we seeing another rezoning at this time? What is the purpose of that? Um, well, the developer has looked at, uh, had an opportunity to look at uh, another um, uh, potential development here. Uh, it would be consolidating the two sites. So the RF5 and the, RA, the adjacent RA7 site would consolidate into one larger RA7. 
um, and to create, you know, uh, potentially a four story um, uh, development there. All right, so the plan is to consolidate the two RA7s together, that would be the same? Um, yeah, one comprehensive site. So it might have multiple site. buildings on it, but it would be one site. Okay. So that would be one owner then. Okay, no, that's that's not um, in relation to that. And for the RA7, I know that in the report, it had mentioned about uh, commercial abilities. Do you see a need for commercial there, considering that there's commercial site right across the street? Exactly. There is already existing commercial uh, across the street, so I don't anticipate that there would be commercial. But but as you said, it is allowed within the within the zone. Um, so it it is in a great spot next to the existing commercial. Right. Okay. And do you do? And I'm not sure if you would do any kind of. Um, uh, looking into seeing what kind of uh, resident to park space there is available, green space. Like, do you ever look at those ratios when uh, coming for an application? I, I know I will be asking that question of administration, but I'm not sure if that's something that you take into consideration when you're asking uh, for a rezoning. Well, at, at the uh, that that's looked at at the neighborhood level. So when the neighborhood plan is created, um, uh, park is allocated throughout the plan based on you know, that 10% uh, in the MGA, so 10% of the gross developable area is allocated as park. And I, I believe we're at that 10% uh, using the full allocation in this neighborhood already. Um, but there's no proposed changes with this small rezoning. Um, the NS, the neighborhood plan is still consistent with, the, with this zoning that's being proposed. Okay, so in June of 2022, I was happy to support the rezoning and the, the plan that was presented to us. But now my concern is that we're just going to get little pockets of rezoning along the way now over the next couple of years. So this is where my concern lies. This might be one small portion, but I could see this uh, continuing to other portions of the neighborhood. This is my concern. Do you see that there's potential for that in the future? Uh, yes, Councillor, there is uh, always potential for changes. Um, that's the, the planning process is set up for that, and that's that's why we have these uh, public hearings as well. Um, this is a relatively minor change. So the going from RA five to RA seven, it's only a, a difference of about twenty nine units um, uh, of average density there. So you know, on a on a site that could accommodate about one hundred and sixty units. We're adding the, the potential for 30 more, um, so it's it's not a it's not a, a major change to the traffic to the to the parks to to um, the, the area in general, and it and it's consistent with um, the city plan as well, and in, in just encouraging uh, densification. Um, so it's it's good in this case. The most of the surrounding lands are not developed yet, and so this is a good opportunity until that you know it doesn't affect people that have already you know, that are already living there. This is this is a greenfield development. The the lands surrounding it are, are relatively un, undeveloped um, and will be undergoing development over the next few years. So uh, this fits really well into this context of, of, okay. of the plan. Okay, thanks. So you did answer my next question. 20 units more is what's anticipated. What about 20, parking? Uh, 29, there's potential for 29. Okay, um, yeah, and then what about parking? Community. What about parking? Because I know that was an issue with residents in the area. Uh, well, I mean, parking will be accommodated on site. Um, we There is no specific site plan, so there's no development permit for this site yet. So that would be subject to that uh, development permit uh, approval. But okay. um, thank you. But yeah, part, there would be parking on site. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate thank everyone you. being so diligent with the time today. Any other questions for the applicant from council members? Okay, and we do not have any speakers in opposition. I'm just gonna check to the clerk. There's nobody that's, nope, okay. No, and we so don't we have go, any. Yeah, we will go to questions of administration. And yes, please go ahead, take it away, Councillor Prince <laughs> Thank you, Chair Rutherford. Uh, so I do have that question. I'm just uh, concerned about the residents per hectare and also just ensuring that there is adequate 
green space. Thank you, Councillor. Um, in terms of the green space, the planned um, is six to eight hectares per thousand people, which is in line. It's quite high in terms of the, the projections from Breathe. Um, and the park designations, the applicant was correct. You're looking at 9.75 at the NSP level, which is very close to the 10%. And then if you go up to the ASP level, which covers a few of the neighborhoods, you are at 10%. Um, so sometimes there's just slight differences in allocation. There might have been a little bit more that needed to be protected in one spot or um, how that MR is allocated. But they're, they're right, right within the margin for that. Okay. And... Um I did have another question. Yes, the future transit corridor. I know that we are having some concerns on the north side with neighborhood design, not being able to accommodate transit. Is this something that will be addressed in this neighborhood? Will it actually be able to accommodate transit? Uh, yes, Councillor. Uh, as part of uh, development occurring south of this site, uh, there will be an additional collector connection to 66th Street that will be built. Completion of that uh, collector connection will allow uh, a better bus routing between uh, this neighborhood and McConaughey. At present, there is uh, uh, local service, 24-hour uh, service available to this area, and that will continue. But definitely, there will be efficiencies with additional collector connection. Okay, great, thank you. And I know that you had said that it aligns with the NSP. I know it, it um, is originally uh, zoned for medium density, at this time currently, medium density. And if this zoning does pass, it would still be considered medium density, correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay. Um, and then I'm concerned, you know, I'm bringing the voice of the residents who are concerned about parking and traffic. How will that be addressed? From the perspective of parking, it is something that the, the city has uh, determined we will do um, uh, at the needs of the development itself. So it's not something that we would consider at the rezoning stage. Um, in terms of transportation, the analysis was complete. And if there's anything you can add, Faisal? Yeah, as mentioned by uh, the applicant, the change is uh, insignificant in terms of uh, the number of units. Uh, as part of the NSP TIA, this kind of uh, development was already contemplated, so uh, we don't anticipate anything over and above needed. Okay, and one sentence that I read in the report, I, I kind of am concerned about the wording. It, it says about encouraging diverse development in an area so that communities can evolve over time. But that's like, a, I feel a little bit of a stretch because the community is just being built. It's it's not really necessarily evolving. It was just last year that we appro approved the zoning. So it seems to me, again, my concern is that now we approve this and then this will change and this will. So my concern is that we'll continue getting new rezonings in the area over the next few years. Thank you for that. I, I think the important thing to center ourselves around is the, the neighborhood structure plan does have broader bands of development and there are many zones that can fit within that. Um, you will see a change with that if the new zoning bylaw is, is approved where there's a few less to choose from. Um, however, the it's it's not atypical to have, maybe in such a short time, but it's not it's not abnormal to have different categories maybe being selected depending on how the market might be shifting or the product that might be there. Um, and the NSPs are designed at a conceptual level so that you have some of that flexibility for the landowner to, to be able to make some of those changes. Our position would always be that we will evaluate the individual application that comes along and, and does that make sense? So regardless of how many times it comes before us, it may still be an appropriate use given the space, even if it is changing. Um, so I would say that's that's kind of the, the the general approach to it that we can we can provide that we do take that analysis um, and say does this fit within the context of what's being proposed? Okay, and then the the sentence about evolving over time, it does is that really? I'll, I'll take that into, into consideration when we're looking through the reports. But I think that it's important that the, the city plan, again, because that's the, the section that you're looking over, is, is you know, providing that guidance and the ability for us to make some of those changes. And as these plans kind of develop, having certain street patterns, having different bands of development do, do make it so that communities okay. can continue yeah. to adapt. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Please come back for another round if you would like, Councillor Principe. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a quick question. One of the things that uh, residents in the in the area have been concerned with for a number of years is uh, um, the infrastructure on 167th Avenue, a few blocks south of this. And I'm just wondering, um, as this proceeds, how that uh, plays into the uh, the developer contribution for infrastructure and uh, what the timeline looks like for that area, because that sort of a connects Council Principe's ward and my ward. Yes, uh, Councillor Paquette, uh, uh, in the immediate vicinity of the zoning side, we have uh, 66th Street uh, that is uh, part of uh, the ARA contribution. Uh, as the area develops uh, and the subdivisions are coming forward, uh, uh, the widening of 66th Street from two to four lane has already be, uh, been a condition of uh, multiple subdivisions, so that is uh, developer responsibility. As far as 167 Avenue is concerned, east of 66th Street, uh, uh, there are city obligations uh, uh, attached to uh, widening that corridor. Um, we already have a motion uh, that was made by Councillor Nack early this year, and uh, um, uh, part of that motion was to look into city obligations citywide. Uh, that yeah. report is coming to Council uh, towards the end of October, I believe. And yeah. uh, that will uh, touch on, uh, on, on that element uh, a bit more. Okay, so maybe you can unpack this a little bit um, because this goes to sort of approving this and uh, the infrastructure that's needed to support it. Um, where I'm specifically thinking is uh, 167th Ave and 66th Street, the intersection there and how the city and developers are gonna be working together. Because if, if memory serves, and it does, 167th was actually, or 66th Street has an enormous amount of pressure on it growing because for some reason, the province decided not to do the overpass on 50th on Hende, uh, which was originally planned. And so now we've got all this traffic pouring down one, pouring down 66th uh, Street and causing gridlock right in that area. And it's only getting worse as we get more development in the area. So where is that, you know, is that something that uh, administration is recommending to council to invest in this infrastructure? Or is that something that, uh, you know, in paired with Councillor Nack's uh, motion, is that something that Council Principe or myself uh, would have to bring forward in order to get that infrastructure finally done after more than a decade? Um, and I know that sounds like an infrastructure question, but it's infrastructure support for the development that we're looking at. So, um two things that you have raised here. One is related to 66th Street uh, that I mentioned in terms of uh, obligation, that is uh, developer's obligation and uh, uh, that widening or upgrading the infrastructure is already tied to a number of subdivisions. So that will happen. Um, uh, it's already identified that uh, this uh, corridor has reached uh, uh, the capacity and requires uh, widening. In terms of uh, the intersection, um, uh, there there will be upgrades to that intersection to a roundabout uh, as part of uh, first stage uh, upgrade, and uh, that will be tied to the next uh, subdivision in this area, which is likely uh, the northwest parcel that is vacant at the moment. Um, we don't need any motion or anything. We do have a plan uh, in, term, uh, in terms of uh, staging the network uh, as the development is progressing. Uh, but the bigger question in terms of uh, citywide obligations, I think that's, uh, that's uh, uh, already uh, um, uh, a work in progress and uh, will be brought forward um, end of this month. Okay, so, and, and then the, just finally, just you know, to, to tie this one up. So this land use, if approved, uh, means that there's going to be more pressure on what are already pressured systems. So. Um, is it possible for, uh, I mean, all of council, if they want it, but uh, specifically Council Principe and I, to get a memo on the timeline, the expected timeline on that, on, on those infrastructure improvements? Uh, again, we don't need uh, a memo or a motion for that. Well, we might need a memo. 
Councillor Paquette, it's Kim. Um, we can certainly follow up with the information um, to articulate the staging and phasing of what we know in terms of the improvements on 66th Street and 167th Ave. That combined with the report that's coming to committee at the end of October, I believe, around arterial roadways. So we Perfect. can commit Thank to you. follow up on that. Okay. okay. Thank you. And Councillor Prince Bay, can you take the chair? Sure, I have the chair. Thank you. Um, so wait, can you just go back to your answer to Councillor Paquette's question, where is there an interim traffic circle getting put? Is that what, 66th and 167th? Uh, that is uh, 66th Street and uh, 167 Avenue. 167 Ave, okay. Um, I also noticed that there's a traffic circle right near the, the site in question. What, and I guess, you know, if this is approved, today, what in the development stage considerations does administration take in terms of making sure there's not high interface with traffic coming and going from these, this R RA7 site and the next RA7 site that it will be adjoined to and that traffic circle? Is there any upgrades planned for that traffic circle or how are we considering, how do we consider that interface uh, in the next stage? So the construction of that collector was already contemplated as part of uh, the overall NSP, which included these land uses, uh, RA7 and all the other okay. land uses. So the construction is already addressing the needs of the development. Oh, yes, I get that, but I'm just asking, I get, I, I, from my, my perspective, uh, you know, if I'm approving this site, it's gonna increase, you know, several several units, more traffic, I'm just making sure that it's set back enough. Where are, do we have any sense in the application that we've received of where people will be exiting and exiting and entering that site from? Yes, there is a roadway just adjacent to this site uh, uh, that will connect to the existing roundabout. And in terms of uh, the change, uh, as mentioned by the applicant, it is in the realm of uh, 29, 30 yep. units which basically translates into 15, 20 additional trips. Okay, that's all, that's all my questions, thank you. I'll take the chair back. Okay, can you move a second round? I, I well, I'll no, I would like someone else to because I've just taken the chair back. <laughs> Happy to well, move thank that. You. Okay, Councillor Knack has moved a second round. Second. And it's seconded by Councillor Tang. Can we please vote for a second round? We're just missing two votes, Councillor Jans and Councillor Salvador. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. And I will go to Councillor Principe for her second round of questions. Thank you, Chair Rutherford. Uh, I just wanted to question again uh, the interim traffic circle. Is that in regards to 167 Avenue and 66th Street, or is that the 169A Street? 167 and 66. That's One, it, 167 interim. Avenue and 166th Street. Okay, can you explain what an interim traffic circle is? So the interim traffic circle means that it will be um, a single lane roundabout um, for uh, improving the traffic. We, are, we have done uh, an analysis to see whether widening the lanes and installing uh, continue to, continuous use of uh, uh, traffic signal will be appropriate versus uh, installing a roundabout that will give us uh, more design life in terms of uh, uh, traffic capacity. Uh, we did that work, uh, I believe a couple of years ago, brought that forward to council. We did some amendments to ARA in that regard as well in order to make it happen. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that analysis is already in place. Correct, so that um, roundabout will go from two lane to one, way, one lane. Yes, I'm going by memory here. I don't have the design in front of me. It's just uh, because it is going to, um, uh, it has to tie in with 167 Avenue, which is just uh, two lanes. Uh, so there is some lane balancing there, but eventually uh, once 167 Avenue is widened, the roundabout will get to its ultimate stage and uh, uh, 
uh, unfortunately, I don't have the design. Um, so would there be here. traffic lights after once it's widened? I don't have that information in front of me. Sorry, Council Principe, we can provide that information in the memo to Council that we've committed to just providing uh, with Councillor Paquette's conversation so that there's clear, it's clear what's proposed uh, now in terms of an interim solution and what might be contemplated in the future. Um, and perhaps we can include a graphic if, if that's helpful. Okay, yes, I have seen the graphic uh, before, but just still concerning to me. So yeah, I would like to, if you could follow up, that would be great, thanks, I appreciate that. And then I, I still do wanna go back to the um, green space because that is still concerning to me. Can you tell me what the residence per hectare would be uh, if this zoning is approved, rezoning? It would fall within the six to eight hectares per thousand people. Okay, so per thousand people. Yeah. Sorry, and I know so I, I who also is really good at math and can tell me how many residents per hectare that is. Uh, how many Anyone? residents per hectare? Right, two hundred and fifty. Councillor, what's important uh, for the parks conversation here is that the the city has taken its full allotment of MR, um, so that full ten percent, uh, and that's typically how. We acquire and judge the amount of space in greenfield neighborhoods is, is on that 10% and not necessarily on uh, that six to eight uh, hectares per thousand measure uh, as outlined in Breathe because we're, we do take the full allotment that we can uh, through our planning processes. Uh, so if the, the question is around is that enough park space, uh, that is all that we can get is that 10%. Okay, so this is, you're talking about the area structure plan or the neighborhood structure plan? Both. Both. I believe the neighborhood structure plan's at 9.7%, which uh, some of that extra percentage might have gone to a, a larger park system or a different type of space across the area uh, to hit that 10%, uh, and that is not abnormal through the neighborhood planning process. Uh, we usually use that bigger ASP level uh, to help balance out uh, the MR and, and the different types of spaces that are provided within it. Okay, great, thank you. I think um, Councillor Paquette asked my other question, so thank you, that's it, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, and I will go to Councillor Tang. Great, thank you. Um, this is a fairly new neighborhood, right? It's, um, and do you have a sense of what percentage of the neighborhood is developed? I'd have to, I, I, I don't have a number on that, but I'd be sitting around, I think, 15, 20% by eyeballing it. So counselor. still lots of opportunities and, you know, clearly green, field, uh, or green space is a big priority for, sounds like, for some of the residents. And, uh, but there's just, I guess my point is that there's still lots to be developed and this is, one that I'm looking at it is surrounded by other um, medium density RF5 and then adjacent to another RE7. And I'm curious, you have referenced the zoning bylaw and of course this is not, you know, that has its own hearing and we remain very open until we hear from everybody. But I'm wondering if you can help me out with the Know Your Zone map. If uh, un under the, the zoning bylaw, um, if approved, what would these, um, zone speed would be the MS. The the new zone would be the medium scale residential zone, the RM zone, with the sixteen meter height modifier for um, the for the RF five or the RA for the RA seven. Right. Should should the zoning right. bylaw be approved? I guess Correct. I just wanted to kind of follow up on the comment earlier around kind of future, you know, potential of these pockets of a rezoning happening, but kind of the intent there would be potentially, if approved, it would be kind of more of a consistency. And, and I think again, and to, depending on what it is, to bring it back because it is again a, a relatively newly developing neighborhood. Mm -hmm. the, the plan does allow for this diversity here, as mm -hmm. well in the medium density designation. Okay, yeah, that's that's what I was just curious about. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Tang, and um, I will go back to the applicant if there are any questions from Council arising from inf 
new information, uh, please sign up. I'm not seeing anybody. Uh, would anybody like to close the public hearing on this item? Yes. I'll move closure of the public hearing on item 3.11. I'll second that. Okay, so that's closure of the public hearing. Uh, moved by Councillor Knack and seconded by Councillor Tang. And please vote. Just checking to make sure it's coming up for everyone as we're missing a couple of votes. Councillor Paquette and Councillor Rice, is the vote come up for you? We're still waiting on your vote. Just now, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank Sorry, you very much. I was, on, I was on the report, not on the voting page. That's okay. Thank you very much. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. I'll move first reading of item 3.11. Second. So moved by Nat, Councillor Nack and second by Councillor Tang. And do we have anybody that would like to speak to first reading? And I see someone on the board, so I will go to Councillor Principe to speak on this item. Thank you, Chair Rutherford. Uh, I would like to say that um, I appreciate administration's uh, point of view and uh, I still do have some concerns with the with the change of the rezoning. I am concerned with uh, green space and you know the parking concerns that residents have brought forward. Uh, I, I can't support this application again. I was happy to support the rezoning a year ago as uh, I saw that it was a really good uh, development for the area and and we would like to see it get developed and we would like to see 66th Street and 167 Avenue get widened. Um, but my concern is um, continuing uh, increasing density in an area where I feel the density as as it is zoned right now would be appropriate. So that is uh, where I stand on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. And Councillor Knack, would you care to close? No, I'm good. Thank you. And just uh, speak closer to your mic with the, the mask on, just, okay, perfect. Oh, uh, Councillor Paquette, I do see you on the board, so it's a good thing we didn't close. Sorry about that, oh. Councillor Paquette. Please yeah. go ahead with your closing remarks. Oh, no worries. Just really quickly, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I absolutely agree with Councillor Principe. Um, we are getting, uh, these new neighborhoods, by the way, have uh, quite high density, and uh, it actually works if there's the infrastructure to support it. The problem is that we don't actually have the infrastructure to support it right now. So we're approving something that uh, can't handle uh, the increased density in a reasonable fashion. Uh, I, I will vote for it, um, but we really need to make sure that we're not playing so much of a game of catch up that we're literally, um, you know, election cycles behind on, on some of this infrastructure. And I get it. We're in a pinch. We've had to cut corners uh, in a lot of ways, but uh if we're going to actually get this development we also need the infrastructure to support it which is the entire conversation coming up around zbr as well um this is you know these new communities are a really good example of what you need when you have higher density uh so um looking forward to uh, councillor knack's motion coming back uh which hopefully uh addresses this and uh yeah and uh you know, we're, you know, Council Principe and I have been feeling this pinch uh, for Council Principe's entire term. And, uh, you know, uh, everyone else will actually probably start feeling some of this uh, if you've got any suburban development happening. And, and frankly, for even with infill and things like that, we're going to feel that pinch, which, uh, you know, may be going off on a bit of a tangent, but this is also why Alberta Municipalities is calling on the provincial government to actually take a look at the rate of our growth and to fund infrastructure appropriately, not three times less than we used to get, but actually more than we used to get. Um, for those who don't know, we're getting about $150 million per person. It used to be 
in the four hundred dollar uh, range, four fifty range, and we'd like to get at least back up to there. We won't, but it would have been nice. Anyway, that's my little soapbox. I'm going to get off it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Prince Bay, can you take the chair? Yes, I have the chair. Please go ahead, Councillor Rutherford. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I was just inspired to speak with my uh, fellow colleagues here. I think, you know, as excited as I am to see the report coming back from Councillor that that Councillor enacted the motion on, I suspect that that report is going to show a lot of areas within the city that are feeling pinch points and extreme pressures. And, and there's only so much, as we know, resources to go around to, and they always end up getting prioritized. So I do think there is a bigger conversation that, you know, while again, I hear the arguments that this is, you know, RF5 to RF7, adding 20 units, yes, but there is a cumulative impact and we have to start to look at, you know, on the bigger picture scale, how are we making sure that the infrastructure is there prior to people being in those neighborhoods, especially in the greenfield developments? So uh, I, I will also support it, but I do see that, they see that there is a need for a bigger conversation around how, how we're approving density without the infrastructure to match it. Thank you. And I'll take the chair back. The chair is yours. And, and Councillor Knack, no, one more time, no further. No, I'm still good, thank you. Okay, thank you, and we, I will call the vote. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. I'll move second reading of item 3.11. Second. Okay, please vote. We're just waiting on one vote from Councillor Jans. Thank you, we have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. I'll move consideration of third reading on item 3.11. Second. And uh, please vote for consideration. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. And I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20619. Second. Please vote for third and final reading. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. And my understanding before we move on to the to to the the next bylaw is there may be a possible subsequent, Councilor Prince Pay. Yes, thank you, Chair Rutherford. Uh, I would like to um, move a subsequent motion, and I hope I might be able to get some help with the wording from administration. And thank you to uh, Councilor Rutherford for helping me out on this. Uh, that administration provide a report to committee to explore fully signalizing the intersection at 167 Avenue and 66th Street without a traffic circle as an interim measure at and included the cost benefit analysis with both the interim and then signalized or going straight to fully signalized. Need a seconder? Second. Okay, that is moved by Councillor Prince Pay and seconded by Councillor Knack. And I will go to you to introduce Councillor Prince Pay. Thank you, Chair Rutherford. So there have been many concerns with, uh, as Councillor Paquette had mentioned, with the um, increase in traffic volume. Uh, 66th Street is a major connection to the Anthony Henday for Northside. And uh, the, a concern 
of having um, a traffic circle circle in that area uh, could also condense uh, the traffic more so. So we would like to just get an idea, or I would like to get an idea, and uh, hopefully some of my other colleagues would like to also get an idea of what that impact would be if we did fully signalize um, that intersection. So I do hope that my colleagues would indulge me in, in receiving this information. And thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Prince Bay. Are there any questions on the motion? See, Councillor Salvador, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I guess just really quickly, it would be to administration, uh, wondering the work that is directed by this motion, um, how would that intersect with some of the ongoing work we have related to the prioritization of um, you know, various intersections across the city that um, we're, yeah, looking looking to signalize or upgrade. Um, yeah, how would, how would it dovetail with some of that work? Or would this bump it higher on the priority list? I, I don't fully understand what that would look like. Councillor Salvador, I, I may be going to have to look to the team to help uh, with, with answering this, but we do have a report coming at the end of October um, that Councillor Nack had made a motion related to um, what intersections would become a priority given safety or uh, operational concerns. Uh, and I'm just going to maybe look to Fazel if you feel there, how this, this work would maybe intersect with some of the work that we're already doing in this space. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Councillor, uh, in terms of the motion, uh, I would comment uh, that uh, this, that intersection is already signalized. Uh, there are signals installed already. So uh, just clarification on that part. And in terms of uh, any um, exploring any other elements of what can be done to support uh, uh, infrastructure or uh, whether it's a roundabout or not, I think it will be prudent to um, rely on, on that report coming in forward uh, so that we have clear understanding where the pinch points are and where we can uh, invest. And um, uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, this roundabout is already uh, developer's obligation as we changed it through the ARA bylaw amendment. So it is already developer's responsibility. The challenge is to the east where 167 straddles between two lanes and four lanes and making that uh, consistent uh, four lanes is, is where the challenge lies. So I think uh, uh, that's, that's where uh, my understanding is. I would leave that to Kim and Travis too. Yeah, just, just to add, I think um, th this motion, if still desired, would probably be best uh, made at that report. Uh, in, at the end of the month here where it's analyzing the growth impacts and where uh, the priorities lie with council uh, as this this may add or duplicate uh, some of the analysis coming out of there okay that's really helpful and um, yeah that sounds like it could be a good path forward if if that report's already coming um, in front of council it could be an opportunity to build off that based on the information we get at that time um, but I'll, I'll leave it there thank you so much Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, so, just so I have an, and to ensure my understanding is correct here, um, we've got on the east side of 66, um, four lane until you reach about a block and a half before the intersection. And it goes down to two lanes. And then it's two lanes all the way through. We've got um, Folks coming off the Henday or going on to the Henday down 66, um, which is also uh, just uh, two lanes until you reach uh, turnoffs. Anyway, the point is that with, uh, with right now it's fully signalized and we're getting backups uh, on both sides of the road because we get, it basically funnels people down uh, from multiple lanes to uh, you know just one lane each way. And so you get all these backups happening. And the idea of the traffic circle was that you could have a free flow of traffic so you don't get those backups. Do I understand that correctly? 
as people are waiting for lights and traffic just keeps building and then some get through the light and then you still have, but the, the traffic circle uh, concept is the idea is that it provides a free, a free flow. So no one's actually just stopped idling for multiple lights at a time. It's just continuous traffic. That's correct, uh, Councillor, and I would uh, offer that um, uh, the analysis that I was mentioning earlier, uh, we would be more than happy to share that with your office uh, with, uh, uh, as a starting point to, to look at what was contemplated as part of uh, uh, adding capacity, the design life, and uh, how uh, a traffic circle is better than signal. Uh, all that work was already done. So what yep. we can do is, is definitely share that information with your office. Yeah, that would be helpful just to, you know, to refresh everyone. Um, I know that some people don't like traffic circles. I get it. But uh, we see throughout the city that this actually like avoids that sort of uh, uh, rush hour jam. So the next question, though, is... Um, just cost effectiveness is that like when 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 council principal space asks for a cost benefit analysis right now we already have fully signalized intersection there it's going to then move to a traffic circle and then later move back to fully <laughs> signalized because uh we don't have uh, from the city side we don't uh have the budget to do the infrastructure the way it's required right now so the traffic circle is a stopgap and there's an investment there, but that that's going to be sort of addressed, right? Like, okay, so this is how much it's going to cost for that traffic circle in the interim. This is how much it costs for everything else uh, around there. And then to put the new lights in, and this is why we recommend this as the best approach. Is that sort of what we're going to hear in this, in this report? Uh Again, uh, clarification there, Councillor Paquette. Uh, in terms of traffic signal, uh, what got analyzed was uh, both the first stage of this traffic signal uh, or the roundabout, uh, rather, um, and uh, the ultimate stage as well. So it will remain a roundabout in both the stages. It is just the lane configuration that will change and address to the capacity needs. Okay, so we'll never go back to full signalization. It will remain as the uh, roundabout. Absolutely. Okay. I, I just got to say, it's been fun talking about this for six years. But uh, yeah, I support this motion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Maybe just to the mover, um, given the response to some of the earlier questions around the work that's that's underway um, that, that could address this and sort of a opportunity coming up at the end of the month for, for potential subsequent after we have a bit more of that information, just wondering what your thoughts were in terms of continuing to move forward with this at this time. Yes, thank you for that question. As was pointed out, and I forget that not everyone realizes, this currently is a traffic signal area. So I, it just seems quite backwards to take out a traffic signal intersection, put in uh, the traffic circle, and then potentially putting in traffic lights again. That just, I, I still see this as, a se as separate. Although maybe there's a connection to the two, I still see it as, as different um, uh, avenues. So again, as Councillor Paquette was saying, we're going, we have just a very short area where it goes to two lanes. It goes from four lanes to two lanes to four lanes, both 167 Avenue and 66th Street. And I don't think adding a traffic circle is going to help with that congestion. I do believe that actually widening that small portion that needs to be completed will be the answer to that. And, and I would just like to see the, the cost benefit analysis on this particular area, as this is you know one of the greatest concerns that I've brought forward over and over again uh, to council. So I, I would really appreciate the support in seeing specifically this area, just the, the cost benefit analysis. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that, and 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 you know appreciate your advocacy for your residents that are that are impacted by this. So, so just from my understanding, maybe to administration. So, in terms of what um, Councillor Principe has just highlighted in terms of cost benefit, 
sorry, can you just help me understand again if that's that's sort of um, part and parcel of the work that's already underway in terms of that prioritization process? So, Councillor, the, the work uh, and the report that's coming forward at the end of the month is a prioritization of the existing city obligations uh, for arterial growth, um, which will identify the, those top priorities uh, for consideration and what to do next. Uh, part of that analysis in terms of what to do next uh, would come out of those reports if this area or any other area uh, were brought forward as a top priority and to be brought forward as for funding as well. Uh, so in terms of doing an analysis of the cost benefit of the whole corridor, um, it, it is a little bit premature in our view uh, ahead of that conversation. Uh, and just to, to add and, and clarify, uh, I think Councillor Principe said that the intersection is going to go back in its ultimate configuration to uh, signalize intersection. Uh, Mr. Saeed mentioned that uh, the final configuration is going to be a traffic circle, but the traffic circle will, will be widened as the infrastructure is staged. Uh, so it's not going to flip back and forth. Um, it's a staging of the current infrastructure to align with funding and other area obligations within the area. Okay, so it, it just occurs to me that some of the questions I think this motion is getting to, we may actually have much sooner than January 2024, that we may have some of, at least some amount of clarity um, by the end of this month when that report comes forward. Is that fair? Councillor Stevenson, what I could suggest is uh, we've committed to provide a memo to Council just on the staging and phasing of the work that's planned or known uh, in terms of developer obligations related to 66th Street and 167th, and then clarity on the city obligations, as well as providing some capacity and design life details that um, Fazl had alluded to. We can provide that information in advance of the report at the end of the month. And then perhaps if, if that works, then we can kind of go from there in terms of any subsequent motion or follow-up that might be needed for alternatives or improvements. Okay, so, so we will have more information to make an even more specific and meaningful motion, um, you know, in a few weeks' time, potentially. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. That, that answers all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Knapp. Uh, thank you. So maybe I'm just because I appreciate our, the mover's intent to like try to make sure this is being captured still. Can can essentially that memo be an additional attachment to the October report? And that way it's sort of like all coming in the same place and then we're not actually waiting until January for this. We're, we're getting it all as part of that holistic conversation. Is that possible? Councillor Knapp, I believe the report... <laughs> Um, I, I will have to take that away. Uh, the report might be finalized already yeah. for, or like for the a, agenda. Or like a late edition or something. I'm just trying to figure out a way because I, I, I'm hearing the mover's intent of wanting to capture this. I, I just figured because doing a report in 13 weeks feels like it's an unnecessary step if you've already got that and if it can just be added in a late attachment, maybe we, we solve all the problems at once there. Or even a memo to council in yeah. advance, right? Yeah. To be able to put that as much information as we can in a memo in advance of that report at the end of the month. So I guess I'm looking to the mover and getting your thoughts on on that, on what 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 the best approach is to, because I think if we do this, then we're actually waiting longer to get what you want, and and there might be a better solution coming up. But I'd love your thoughts because I, I also I appreciate what you're saying because I I have areas just like this in my neck of the woods and and we've done motions on it, so. Yes, thank you, Councillor Knack. I was actually trying to sign up again oh. here. Uh, thank you for. Um, you know, suggesting that as an alternative. And I think at this time I will withdraw. Once again, I'll withdraw my motion, as I feel I often do, because I don't believe I will be getting enough support for it. And uh, I'm concerned that I may not be able to uh, see it go further later on if, uh, if I don't get support for this now. So uh, I, I do look forward to the report at the end of October and hopefully we can um, find uh, a solution that will work okay. for the community. Thank you, and I'm just gonna look to my council colleagues for unanimous consent to withdraw. Not quite yet. No, not yet, okay. So that is not, there is not unanimous consent to withdraw. 
So I will go to Councillor Paquette. If Councillor Knack, you're done with your questions. Okay, Councillor Paquette. Oh wait, it's a second round. Um, I believe you've already had a, a one round on the, the motion, right? Yeah, so can somebody move. move a second round? I will move that. Second. Okay, can we, we uh, vote on a second round, please? Call the vote. Just waiting on votes on the second round, just from Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, we have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Okay, please go ahead, Councillor Paquette. Oh, and thank you, and thank you, Council, for uh, the indulgence through the chair, uh, uh, and not simply outvoting me on, on withdrawal. But um, before we, we do that, I'm just, uh, to the mover who would like to withdraw um the question is um do you feel comfortable that if you withdraw this motion that you will still get some form of attachment to uh what is a finalized report that just gives the context of what you're asking for I, and I, actually maybe before i ask you that i'll ask administration if that's what's going to happen Councillor, I think the in terms of the motion, uh, the cost benefit analysis we won't be able to put together. Uh, but what we do have is the analysis that's gone in to make these decisions in terms of how the roundabout itself uh, was chosen versus traffic lights uh, and how uh, we're staging the infrastructure in the area. We know what the ultimate solution is. Um, it's just a matter of, of getting there in terms of what that design and the capital dollars are, which uh, at the October meeting, uh, there will be a chance for that discussion in terms of priorities um, and how to move these priority areas forward. Okay, so a cost-benefit analysis wasn't done. Um, so I'm assuming what informed this approach is more of just a, a traffic analysis? Uh, well, a traffic analysis and in addition to uh, there was financial analysis as well in terms of those solutions uh, and what made sense in the interim and what was available in terms of the uh, ARA basin funds uh, that could make this happen now uh, instead of waiting for sort of that ultimate solution and, the, and then the cities uh, fulfilling the, the obligations under that uh, ARA bylaw. Okay, will that information be included? Uh, if it's not in the finalized report, would yeah, it be yeah, we can uh, we can include that. Yeah. Okay. So then, to the mover, does that sat uh, to the mover, does that satisfy the concern that you had, and uh, so that's why you're comfortable withdrawing the motion? Yes, because at this time, I, I would like to see then the report in October and see if it addresses the concerns, and uh, if not, then maybe at that time I'll be bringing forward this motion. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, for those responses. We'll be looking for that in the report. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much for your indulgence. Okay. So just to confirm, though, we do have a live motion on the floor. Um, there was not unanimous consent. Are you now providing your consent to withdraw? Excellent confirmation. I am now uh, providing my last little bit of consent that makes it unanimous. Okay. Thank you so much. So we will withdraw that motion. Thank you very much. And we will move on to uh, item 3.12, 3.13, and 3.14, which was selected by Councillor Stevenson. And so we'll just uh, go to administration first. Uh, I, I would like a presentation, so let's just do a presentation. Thank you. The application before you has three components, an amendment to the Riverview Area Structure Plan, or ASP, an amendment to the Riverview Neighborhood 3 Neighborhood Structure Plan, or NSP, and a rezoning. The bylaws and charter bylaw will allow for the continued development of the neighborhood, increase housing diversity in the neighborhood, and will improve the active mode transportation network throughout the neighborhood. Next slide, please. This application encompasses approximately 48 hectares of land located south of Muskegosi Trail Northwest, or 23rd Avenue, 
east of 199th Street Northwest, west of 184th Street Northwest, and north of the North Saskatchewan River Valley and Ravine system. Lands adjacent to the proposed rezoning are in the early stages of development with residential and stormwater management to the north and east and a future transit center in the northwest portion of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Bylaw 20612 proposes to amend the Riverview Area Structure Plan to align with the proposed changes to the Riverview Neighborhood 3 NSP. The most notable change is the reconfiguration of a school or park site and urban park site to better meet the community's needs. Next slide, please. Bylaw 20613 will create two new land use designations, street-oriented residential and mid-rise high-density residential land uses. Adding both housing diversity to the neighborhood as well as creating improved pedestrian experiences. Street-oriented residential provides for low-density development located along local and major roads requiring laned access. This creates an uninterrupted, safe, pedestrian-friendly streetscape, encouraging active modes of transportation with a modest increase in density over a typical low-density housing form. The new mid-rise and high-density residential category is intended for the provision of mid-rises, multi-unit apartments, and is located in the northwest portion of the plan near the future transit center and commercial uses. The amendment proposes to reduce the area designated as row housing slightly. However, with a, uh, an amendment to the zoning bylaw earlier this year, it also increased the minimum density for row housing from 45 to 60 units per residential hectare to better reflect development in the area. With these amendments, the overall density of the plan will remain the same at 35.5 dwelling units. The location, shape, and size of the parks and the school site have also been amended in the NSP to provide better access to the Topa Bank Road connections to the River Valley Ravine system, to allow for active modes connection using shared use paths, sidewalks, and shared roadways, and to allow for better programmable space. The location, shape, and size of some of the storm ponds have also been adjusted to align with an updated development plans and road layouts. These changes are supported by the necessary engineering analysis. Next slide, please. The NSP was approved in 2014, and since it, its adoption, city direction has evolved and changed. Administration and the applicant worked together to integrate the city plan, the bike plan, and the bike plan implementation guide to promote a safer, more equitable, and comprehensive transportation network. The amendment introduces several changes to the active modes network. While not all collectors have a shared use path, the amendment provides shared use paths, greenway connections, and traffic calming measures, as well as mid-block pedestrian crossings to provide reasonable opportunities to connect to the broader active modes network and amenities within the plan. Next slide, please. Charter bylaw 20614, this is the third one, proposes to amend the zones from the neighborhood from ag or agricultural zone to the RLD or residential low density zone, the RVRH or Riverview row housing zone, and the RA8 medium rise apartment zone. And finally, the US or urban services zone, which will allow for the development of single detach, sorry, I've got all of the uses listed together and I realize now that might be confusing. All of those zones will allow for a general mix of single detached, semi and duplex housing, multi-unit housing in the form of row housing, medium rise and multi-unit housing with limited ground floor commercial uses, as well as schools and parks. The proposed rezoning will be compatible with existing and planned uses. Next slide, please. The application is in the West Hende District and is in a developing area in the city plan. The city plan's big move, community of communities, will be helped here by helping Edmontonians to meet their daily needs within 15 minutes, moving us towards 50% of trips by transit and active modes. And this will be done by locating the medium and high density residential development closer to the transit centers and creating a better, more integrated and enjoyable transportation network for all modes. Next slide, please. Administration reached out using postcards to surrounding property owners and community leagues and prepared online engagement. In total, eight responses were received, noting the following concerned. Road frontages should be wide enough to accommodate two-way uh, two traffic and parking, especially during winter. Pedestrian safety, suggesting curb extensions, pedestrian crossings raised crosswalks and zebra crossings. 
and that the amendment will affect traffic volumes, particularly around the Big Island Provincial Park. Next slide, please. Administration supports this application because it diversifies the housing opportunities in the neighborhood. It supports an integrated multimodal transportation network and it increases density close to a planned transit center. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have several speakers um, in favor. They are all to answer questions only. So I'll just confirm attendance. So we have Christine Lee. Are you available? Would you like to come down to one of the mics? Scott Cole? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Keith Davies? Catherine Oberg? Perfect. And then Tony Chiarello? Hello. Okay, you're remote. Okay. And then Rihanna Riemann? Rihanna Riemann? Oh, perfect. So who's Kath Catherine? You're Catherine? Okay, perfect. Just getting names. Everybody's just coming and taking their seats. And then um, I see already some counselors in uh, on the board for questions of, of our applicants. So once we're settled, we'll get to those. Just take a minute. Perfect, and this item was selected by Councillor Stevenson, so I will go to Councillor Stevenson first for questions of the applicant. Great, thank you so much, and thank you all for being here today. Um, you know, I was really pleased to see a number of the, the updates that were incorporated as part of this amendment, but but a few, a few stood out to me just in terms of things that weren't incorporated. Um, just want to, to get your perspectives on, uh, it's highlighted in the report, some of the um, de facto top of bank uh, walkway that isn't proposed to be a shared use path. Um, you know, just recognizing that these can be, um, you know, really beloved amenities of the residents. Just wondering uh, why that wasn't accommodated. Good afternoon, Councillor Stevenson. It's Catherine Oberg from Budpen Associates. Um, in terms of that portion of the plan area, it is a section where top of bank is not available because of existing country residential land uses. And so because of that constraint, we did look at opportunities to provide connections to the top of bank where we are able to con connect on the other side of existing country residential land uses um, through direct connections in an, in an efficient and direct um, manner. There's an existing road right of way that is available through there that we can utilize to provide multimodal access. It is a low volume, low speed local road that provides access to four country residential units or lots. Um, and in terms of that classification continues to provide level of traffic stress one um, connectivity in that part of the planet area in consideration of the constraints in terms of connecting the top of bank. Okay, maybe maybe just to simplify it a bit further. So, was there a like a physical space constraint that that prevented a shared use path from being included there? Um, at this point in time, we haven't gone through a design um, evaluation of what can be accommodated. Again, the intent is to use the available road right of way. Committing to a shared use path as the typology at this point in planning. Um, eliminates the opportunity to actually look at how to effectively use the right of way. There are a couple of ways that we can provide that connection when we get into the details. Requiring a specific typology at this time, um, we wanted to provide the connection, a shared roadway meets the level of traffic stress. So there's opportunity to look at it again in the future, but it's not, it should not be required at this stage in the NSP because we can meet the intent of the bike plan in terms of connectivity and level of traffic stress. Okay. Um, well, and you know, speaking of, of bike plan, I also noted in the report that it, it mentioned that uh, the incorporation of the city's bicycle network, sort of including all collector roadways, was not something that was accommodated within this amendment. Again, wondering if you can talk me through what the implications of that would have been and why, why um, as applicants, you opted to not, uh, not update to our, our policy standards. 
Sure, um, so the bike network as proposed adheres to the bike plan outline and also exceeds, exceeds the tier one and tier two um, thresholds outlined for developing areas in the bike plan um, implementation guide. So we are actually meeting the intent and the direction of the bike plan um, with the network as proposed. The network includes a combination of top of bank roadways, um, shared use pass with, uh, along arterial roadways. We've got uh, shared use pass within stormwater management facilities. We do have a number of connections on road, uh, within road right of way, along other collectors and local roads to provide the connections and to provide the connectivity across the network. So we've actually met the criteria um, outlined in the bike plan without requiring the use of all the collector roadways. And so that was how we balanced it. We're actually, when we look at the neighborhood, we have a greater opportunity to meet the intent of the bike plan without going to the basics of just providing them on, on collector roadways. So we've actually, um, in terms of spacing, for example, we're meeting and exceeding the criteria for tier two spacing, which is the recommended spacing for suburban areas. Um, we're actually achieving bike network facilities within 250 meters of all residents within the amendment area. So there's some metrics there that we looked at in terms of the bike plan to help guide us in terms of evaluation of what's being provided. Okay, that's really helpful. So you've, you've provided sort of an alternate solution, but still meeting some of the baseline standards um, just in a different way, if I'm understanding. Exactly. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Jans. Thank you. Just going back to those two points, I understand. Um, actually, you know what? Can I hold off for questions to administration? Sure. You do not have any questions for the applicant that you would no. like to ask? Okay. Thank you. And I'll just do one last call for any questions to the applicant. Okay. So just stay there because we might come back after questions arising, as, as you're familiar, I'm sure many of you. Oh, oh, wait. There's a lag time. I, Councillor Tang, please I ask your questions. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the traffic impact assessment that you did as part of your, your application? Um, yes, Councillor Tang, through the chair. We completed, uh, Bunton Associates actually completed the original traffic impact assessment associated with the area structure plan as well as the neighborhood structure plans. When was that? Uh, that was in about 2014, 2015 okay. that those documents were done. So the work that we did with this plan was actually to take a look at the model that we had developed for that original work and we updated it based on the land use information that's currently available for the plan area as well as some other amendments that had happened in, in surrounding neighborhoods. And so we looked at that and compared it to the original work that we had done. There's a minor difference in the trips uh, that would be generated based on the different housing types and the different um, configurations of land use. So slight modifications in terms of sizes of commercial areas and you know a bit of in terms of location. But generally we are able to compare the original plan and the intent of that original plan to what is being proposed from a traffic perspective and traffic accommodation perspective. And you're saying that there was minimal change minimal since the 2014, since 2014, 2015, uh, there was the announcement of the provincial, you know, Big Island Park in that area. There's the two high schools that also, you know, you know uh, that you had mentioned earlier. Um, how were those factored into the latest? Because I would say that's pretty different. Um, the two schools were originally included. So when we looked at the original areas and the, and the neighborhoods, the school and park sites that just were all included in terms of that traffic analysis. So that those land uses were already accommodated. In terms of the um, amenity space within the North Saskatchewan River Valley, again, we need details to understand how traffic may um, change and things like that. That wasn't part of our amendment study. It wasn't part of our original. So it's, we have not included in, in this work. So that would be a separate um, review as as we get additional details or as the city gets additional details regarding what would be included in that planning area. Right, because it's out in the river somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, okay, appreciate those answers, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. And I'm just gonna confirm, Councillor Jans, you are not on the floor for questions to the applicant, correct? No, administration. Okay, thank you, so we will, uh, 
conclude with questions of the applicant and we do not have anybody in opposition so we will now go to questions of administration so council colleagues please sign up if you have any questions and again I will start with Councillor Stevenson who selected this item. Thanks Councillor Rutherford so uh, to administration, I think I heard a pretty uh, compelling answer around some of the decisions around uh, bike plan policy incorporation. Does your analysis um, uh, concur with, with what we shared with from the applicants in terms of some of the network uh, requirements still being met within the neighborhood, even if every collector road isn't, isn't part of that? Yes, Councillor, as part of uh, uh, the review, uh, we were provided with uh, a detailed analysis. Uh, as you mentioned that it's, uh, it, it's not blanket policy that has been written, but a uh, different approach has been taken to, to look into the coverage, the, the directness, uh, connectivity, uh, and uh, generally speaking, yes, uh, uh, it, it does meet uh, uh, the requirements. Um, uh, although not all collectors, like the northeastern portion, a small portion, is, is not part of uh, the bike network, but there are alternatives. Okay, great. That's really helpful. Um, you know, and just in terms of that question of sort of the de facto top of bank, um, so it sounds like that's still something that, that the applicants are open to exploring through more detailed design. Um, I guess I'm just wondering at this point, we wouldn't have any guarantee of that. There, are there any mechanisms through subdivision or anything like that with, that would sort of guarantee the, the, the best infrastructure possible in that location or is it just um, needing to kind of go forward um, uh, to, to do that further detail before having confirmation of what would be there? Guarantee wise, uh, at the subdivision, um, like uh, I think the first reference point is to look at what direction has been set through the NSP, uh, and then uh, go from there. Uh, at this time, the direction here uh, in the proposed uh, in, in the proposal is uh, is to use an alternative um, uh, typology, not necessarily um, a typical top of bank, um, but uh, as the applicant mentioned, that they are open to explore it uh, further at uh, uh, the design stage. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that is to be seen once we have that concept in front of us. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you very much for those answers. No further questions from me. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Jans. Thank you. I'm reading page 11 of the report here, and administration seems to note that um, it is a weakness in the proposed um, plan amendment that the top of bank is not going to be included. I know it would be low volume. I'm thinking of like Saskatchewan Drive in Windsor Park, and for years people would walk or bike along the roadway. Um, but ever since, you know, pathway has been added um, along Windsor Park and Belgravia, it's been so much better. So like I, I know that administration's own words are it's acceptable, but not optimal. So I'm wondering why we would have like, like why, why wasn't the applicant willing to, or, or why, like, I guess could administration maybe share, why are we not going for optimal at this stage in the game? What is, what is, what is being lost here? Why would we settle for less? Councillor, um, we did highlight this as something uh, that that would be wanted to have or requested to be part of this proposal. Uh, I, my suggestion would be that in terms of uh, um, why it was not added, the applicant would be in a better position to uh, answer that question. Um, as mentioned in the report, uh, it is acceptable again, uh, looking at the bigger picture, um, the improvements, uh, uh, the enhancements uh, that are part of this proposal uh, uh, definitely are uh, worth uh, considering. And uh, this connection, yes, that's a weak uh, connection there, but uh, uh, overall, um, uh, uh, 
the plan seems acceptable. Because what I worry about is the plan being executed and then years down the line, um, someone coming forward to a future council and saying, why, why didn't you do it properly and to begin with? And then now they have to pay for it as part of their future neighborhood renewal or something else. And, you know, they're retroactively shaking their fist at previous council for not doing it right from the start. Um, I would clarify that it is, um, again, um, uh, our preference would be to have a uh, con continuous uh, top of bank uh, connection. In this case, the connection is there. Uh, it is just that it will be in a different uh, format. Um, so from connectivity perspective, from usability side of things, and as you mentioned that this uh, is going to be a low volume uh, right of way that can accommodate uh, 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 that connection to be part of uh, the active modes, um, that's where we thought this will be acceptable. Yeah. I think similarly on the bike plan alignment, I mean, administration says they sought to improve uh, the plan. They made, you know, ask that um, amendments had similarly been made in else's and orchards, and but the applicant wasn't a, a supportive of including it. I mean, like, frankly, I, I want to see us striving for gold, not copper. And um, especially on something like this, where it's a plan amendment and you know, shovels aren't in the ground. This is very early on, and we're making a decision that the next century we'll have to live with. So I I personally, I, I would vote against this proposal right Excuse now. Excuse me, we're not speaking oh. to this item. What's your question, Councillor Jans? Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so I guess like why, on the sort of the same vein is if we have a gold standard on like the, the network, um, what is so compelling that we would, that, that the applicant shared with administration that, we wouldn't still go for that. So uh, can you repeat the question? Like it says the applicant was not supportive of including such a policy. Um, but yet it's it's like admin is saying we want gold, but the applicant didn't want gold. They wanted less. So why did we accept less? Like I'm trying to I'm trying to understand here what what got like what's so compelling uh, so we did receive uh, uh, a review that was done uh, in light of the bike plan um, uh, direction, um, uh, the principles, uh, and uh, that approach was taken to uh, see how that uh, direction can be implemented through this plan. And that that is the reason why when we saw and reviewed that, uh, it, it, it does provide uh, us uh, um, uh, enough justification to support this plan, but it's still it's no it notes in your report though that it's not Please as come good back as for a second round, Councillor Jans. Just oh, trying sorry, to stay thanks. stay on time and make sure uh, there's lots of councillors in in line for questions, but but know that there's always the option for a second round, uh, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rutherford. I'll get a little closer to the mic. Um, I, I guess just to ask a few more questions. Originally, I didn't really think too much of that paragraph because, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, we just had a conversation, what, two weeks ago at Urban Planning Committee about the expectation of complete streets and following through on policies. So my assumption was that, frankly, whether or not they put it written in the plan, we have a policy that says, and, and, and guidelines that require collector roads to have bike infrastructure. So. I guess I just want to double check with you, independent of whether they put it in the plan or not, there should be that there because we have higher level guiding policy, do we not? So in terms of bike plan, uh, it does highlight... Uh, uh, the and complete streets, though, to be fair, which also talks about what we expect for roadway design. Correct. Uh, there is no explicit... Uh, direction to include all collectors as part of the bike network. Mm. The bike plan does emphasize on the fact that once we are looking at the district connectors, how those district connectors are connected through the neighborhood routes, that needs to be um, looked into both for developing areas and the mature areas. So 
Okay. Uh, I, I, I smile when you answer, which is probably justification of why we made the motion that we did two weeks ago, which is my understanding is that is an expectation, and to hear that that isn't is a touch surprising because collector roads sh should be, you know, I, I don't want them to have to build a 14 meter wide collector road. I'd rather them build a smaller collector road and make sure that there's a multi-use trail. So um, appreciating that that's, so, so what you're saying is that, that the expectation of a collector road is not to incorporate all modes of transportation um, the way it's designed. So this, th they would not have to design a multi-use trail on the collector road in, in, in these areas. All modes of transportation, definitely, yes. Uh, it is a matter of uh, looking at what sort of uh, uh, connection are, are you building. Is it a, If it is a shared use path and we are highlighting that to be part of the bike network, mm -hmm. that can be analyzed on locational criteria, on directness, on how the uh, overall network density works within the NSP. And those were the things that are highlighted as principles as part of the bike plan mm -hmm. to do that review. Where we left the bike plan and the implementation part is that there is more work that needs to be done for the developing areas. Mm -hmm. We do have good understanding around the mature areas, but there are, not ex there are no explicit uh, uh, direction or policies that are part of uh, uh, the bike plan implementation okay. and the bike plan. But, uh, I would emphasize again and say that collectors, all modes of transportation, definitely yes. Is it a shared use path and a walk uh, and a 1.8 meter walk on one side, or is it 1.8 meter on either side? That determination will be made and is made uh, as part of the review that was given to us. So just to dig in a little more to that, sorry, and because uh, I, I originally didn't even think I was going to have any questions on this plan, but but. So you're saying, again, recognizing council has just, or committee passed a motion two weeks ago to update the complete streets policy to make it more explicitly clear around what's expected. Appreciate that hasn't been fully approved by council yet, that, that will come forward at a later time. But there is in fact a scenario where the collector road in these new communities could be built and you could just have a sidewalk on either side without a multi-use trail. That is uh, a cross section that is within our standards today. Mm -hmm. So, Councillor, uh, mm -hmm. that work on complete streets is uh, ongoing and upcoming. Yep. <clears throat> so, that motion that was made two weeks ago uh, was to ensure uh, that those types of cross sections and those multimodal uh, accommodations were enshrined in that complete streets. Uh, yep. Right now, we're operating in an environment that has uh, a couple of gaps, as Mr. Saeed was saying, that yep. the bike plan implementation strives for that connectivity to those dist district networks. Uh, currently our uh, interpretation uh, is that the collectors are those natural uh, connective points uh, between those district networks, uh, which is why uh, we've been amending uh, existing plans as they come forward to include that type of language uh, to ensure that connectivity is present and that, that uh, those mobility connections are, are throughout those neighborhoods. Uh, so what will happen is that the complete streets uh, will come forward um, and that motion that was been made uh, that will be evaluated and, and put in as, it, as needed. Um, and right now we are taking our, our cues from that bike plan, um, but we don't have that sort of intermediate policy level in between that tells us explicitly that all collectors have to have bike plans right on right now or bike pass on right now, uh, which is why we're seeking uh, to add that through substantive, substantive amendments uh, through the NSP amendment process. Okay, thank you. If you have further questions, Councillor Neck, please come back for a second round. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, so the area where the top of bank is discontinued, um, uh, the top of bank, uh, uh, sort of access is discontinued. Uh, it was mentioned by the proponent that that impacts um, the uh, the ability for that shared use path, but that it's also impacted by the existing country residential 
Um, I'm wondering if administration can speak a little bit more to, uh, obviously we're not in the design stage of this, if you could speak a little bit more to the um, constraints in that area. Sorry, just a point of clarification, Councillor. Are you speaking with regards yeah. to the shared use path or are you speaking with regards to the land use for the area? Uh, shared use path. So, am I missing? Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, go, go ahead, uh, Councillor, if you want no. to elaborate. No, you were about to answer, Mr. Said. Uh, in terms of the constraint, um, Looking at the NSP level, uh, I think this is again uh, how uh, how we see it is is a direction setting uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, what to expect at the detail stage. Uh, if that direction is uh, not shared use path, then uh, it is uh, uh, some level of accommodation through a shared street concept. That's what uh, uh, it is here. And if I can get uh, uh, slide five on the screen just for comparison, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what was the direction provided uh, in the original plan versus what do we have here today? Uh, I think that will further clarify. Uh, uh, if you look at that same area between the two plans, uh, previously it was contemplated to be a uh, shared use path continuation, which is not the case in the current proposal. Uh -huh. And um, I'm so, uh, but what I think I heard from the transportation planner was that not prescribing shared use path at this point doesn't forego it becoming shared use path, but that that would set the minimum sort of standard to go from. And that would put constraints on their ability to work around some environmental issues in the area. Is that your understanding as why they didn't come with um, that shared use path uh, connectivity from the onset? Yeah, that's the justification that was provided to us as well. Uh, that's mm -hmm. correct. So, so to provide maximum optionality in, in dealing with the development of the, the land. Correct. So council, okay. this wouldn't preclude that option in the future. However, they did want to ensure that the option remained available to them if they wanted to choose something else. Yeah, uh, uh, given that there are already, per the land use map, there's already uh, development out there and it is, um, so the, the developers in the area have to work around the existing land use. That is correct. All right, that's very helpful, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate the question so far. So if I'm following correctly, uh, we're essentially operating in an environment right now where there's some gaps um, when it comes to policy direction for active modes infrastructure. In order to address those gaps, we've been amending plans as they come forward um, to include the network principles that are outlined in the bike plan. But this partic particular um, applicant has said uh, no to that policy direction. I guess, first of all, is that correct? <laughs> that is correct. Okay. So if this were, I guess, what would it, what would it take to, to see that policy direction um, met or achieved? Like, is that, does administration feel that that is a viable path forward um, if this were, were sent back? Or do we think that this is essentially as good as good as we can get given some of the constraints that have been outlined? In terms of, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, what you just said at the very end. Uh, that's, that's where we are coming from and that's why we came with the support to this uh, proposal. Uh, there are, uh, in other plans, uh, uh, the difference between this and the others is uh, that uh, yes, the policy direction was there 
In this plan, the proponent uh, um, uh, took a different approach, which was uh, delving into the details of how uh, that uh, uh, bike plan gets implemented. Uh, and, and that's where uh, a review was provided to us and justification of uh, why it looks uh, uh, different um, and a uh, tiered approach was taken to see uh, where what kind of uh, typology will work. Uh, so I think, yeah, uh, long-winded answer, sorry for that, but uh, yes, uh, I think what you said at the very end makes sense. Okay, okay, and then maybe just to loop back, um, it is possible that we see collector roads that just have a sidewalk not a shared use path at this time. I guess what needs to change in order to ensure that things are not being built is just sidewalks. Like I, I recognize there is a gap right now. How do we close that gap? Is that gap already in the works to be closed through um, motion that was made around our complete street standards? I just need to know that that, that gap is actively being closed. Yeah, that's the case. Uh, this, this, uh, that's definitely on the radar and uh, will be dealt with as we uh, update the complete street design and construction standards and through uh, answering that motion as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. I see no more questions to administration. So I will uh, look to my colleagues. I see already someone is on the board so we will go back to the applicants for any uh, further questions arising from uh, new information and I see Councillor Knack no Councillor Hamilton was before I me, saw so. I saw Councillor Hamilton yeah, yeah. okay Councilor I'll go Hamilton. to Councillor the ward Councillor first so Councillor Hamilton please um, ask your questions thank you um, this is to uh, I'll say, maybe I'll start with Ms. Raymond. Um, uh, I understand my colleagues' concerns about the shared use path and, and contiguous connections as well as policy. Um, I, I'm struggling a bit because I understand that this might be outside of the amendment area we're discussing today. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Yes, you are correct. Um, so one of the key components of our amendment was land use statistics and uh, statistics, our land use uh, map changes and statistics changes. So this area is in fact outside of the app, uh, amendment area. And what we did do with the administration is we worked with them to make sure it was a continuous and contiguous uh, network system. This is actually utilizing an existing country residential road. So if there's any desire to be adding shared use paths, there would definitely need to be for future engagement with the affected landowners. So for the purpose and to ensure that we're meeting the intent of the bike plan, we have shown that this connectivity is available, but definitely future op uh, opportunities for an SUP to be incorporated in the future could be explored. But again, this is outside and of our amendment area. Yeah, and to be clear, you're not the landowner that would be uh, affected or responsible for that that contiguous connection. Correct. Correct? And I think it's also yeah. important to note that um, the collector roads within our amendment area all have shared use paths on them. So again, we are the, just oh, except for one little minor piece, but um, yeah, 99% of our collector roads actually have it. And that's because we are the applicants. We only were looking to make the changes within the lands that we own. So future administrative amendments could potentially be made if you want to engage with the other applicants or the other landowners within the affected uh, plan area. Thank you. Could you speak to the shared use path connections on the, the uh, transportation network within your, uh, within the amendment area right now? For sure, I'm actually gonna hand that over to Catherine. She can speak to that much Great. more. Thanks. Um, thank you. We. We looked at the bike plan and we did an evaluation. I recognize council's desire to utilize the collector road network, um, but in the an absence of that direction early on, there are the bike plan offers some direction principles as well as some thresholds for a network spacing to achieve within developing areas that are consistent with other areas of the city. So for example, the high density area, which is our town center area in the northwest corner of the plan area, that would be tier one spacing, which is equivalent to some of the mature areas in Edmonton. 
and like downtown all over that area. So we're actually, ex we're meeting that and exceeding that network spacing. So we used those principles and those thresholds to help create a bike plan that was connected and was, you know, allowed us to get to all of the land uses and the, the recreational, commercial, school sites in a different way. So we took a different approach to this. We agree that the use of the collector roadways is one way to do that um, and is really effective where you don't have as many natural features or other ways to provide connectivity. River's Edge benefits from the top of bank. It benefits from, in some ways, uh, an arterial that bisects it that has um, shared use paths both sides now. We've incorporated that into the plan. So it was really looking at the intent of the bike lane and saying, how can we meet this? Um, and doing it in a way where we're maximizing the opportunities to do it outside of road right of way. So in terms Thanks. of the... Sorry, Sorry I'm, I'm running out of time. <laughs> fine, um, uh, so I'm understanding from what you're saying is that there's a policy lag that it, if council gives direction today for something, uh, plan amendments won't show it for for months, it, sometimes going on a year or two because of the way that planning is undertaken. Is that correct? That is correct. There is a lag, but I also okay. yeah, but, I also think that the yeah. policy provides direction. The, okay, that that's helpful um, and and does create optionality uh, sort of because we haven't reached design stage on this correct. phase. Correct. Okay, and then my last question is that this is, the, the majority of this amendment relates to the school site. And I know in this area that parents have been literally screaming for years uh, to get their kids into a school that's less than 10 kilometers away from their home. Um, and uh, how would this impact the uh, ability of that school site to be um, utilized if this was, were not to pass today? So through, through you, uh, Chair, to Councillor Hamilton, um, the school site reconfiguration was minor, and um, if this uh, amendment weren't approved, uh, it would have significant impacts as um, uh, both sites, uh, or sorry, the site for both a Catholic and public school are now on the three-year capital plan from both boards, and uh, they would like to uh, move forward in the near future as soon as they have funding. Great. Thank you. That's my time. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the robust discussion and, and really appreciated your earlier responses to my questions. So, um, you know, you've heard the discussion. Just, just for my understanding, you know, I really appreciate your point about wanting a bit of optionality as you move towards the more detailed designs. Um, but is there is there sort of a commitment and desire from from the applicants to Again, if it's if it's technically feasible, if there's an opportunity uh, to include um, a shared use path, for example, on that de facto top of bank, is there interest in pursuing that? It's just at this point wanting to keep the options open in case there are technical constraints. Um, in terms of it, so there's a there's a couple of different ways that those connections can be provided, and I think in terms of finding the appropriate solution, we want to be able to use all the tools in the toolbox. Um, whether that's using existing road right of way, which of course is an efficient use of public land, um, or whether or not it's incorporated and shifted into the plan area, there's an opportunity to, to provide that connectivity in a couple of different ways. But they also have trade-offs, so we need to have the ability to look at, you know, what ki kind of environment we can create, um, what opportunities are available. And again, specifying the typology at this time, we have, again, we're wanting an active modes connection in that location. That's our objective. Um, and we want to find a way that we can do that, um, that, you know, respects land, <laughs> respects um, cost as well, um, and while continuing to provide that connection. Great. Okay, well, thank you. That was the only question I had. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. Stevenson and um, I I know that I have seen that there's in there is an intention for um, a motion that would have to be made before closure of the public hearing uh, is is if that is so desired or or if we want to close public hearing I I'm looking to my colleagues. I will actually, you know what? I'm going to defer 
to the ward counselor on this one. Counselor Hamilton, would you, would, would you like to put something on the floor? I was gonna move closure. Second. So I'll move closure. Okay, we have closure on the floor. So if you do not agree with closure, you can vote no. Um, and it's simple majority for, for closure, right? Yep, okay. So we will, we have a um, move, moving of closure on the floor. So please, I uh, call the vote. Councilor Salvador is yes. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. We're just waiting on one vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have all the votes. Okay, please display the vote. Okay, that is carried. And I will again go to Councillor Hamilton. Yes, I'll move first reading of items 3.12, 3.13, and 3.14. Second. That's perfect. So we have a first reading on the floor, and this is opportunity if anyone would like to speak to this bylaw. And I see a few folks on the, the floor to speak, so I will go to Councillor Jans first to speak. Thank you. I'd like to thank the applicant for coming forward with some workarounds, and I'd like to thank our administration for the detailed report that they've provided. I um, I, I want to make clear that when I read words that the administration have wrote that um, lead me to conclude that we aren't, um, we aren't, we are either, as I said, uh, settling or compromising or in any way not to spend, not demanding the best of ourselves for our future generations. I get quite concerned about that. And, and uh, um, I decided not to move a motion to refer back today, but I think for future, um, public hearings and for future reports, especially when we're dealing with something like a, a plan amendment, uh, especially this early on in the process. Um, I, I hope that applicants are more willing in future to to help bring forward um, better, better solutions that get administration as excited about the reports as we'd like to see them. As a mature neighborhood counselor who's going through countless neighborhood renewals right now, uh, I think many of us are kicking ourselves for we just wish we did it right from the start. And we wish we knew then what we know now. And um, when, really, when I think about these, it's, you know, when we talk about multi-use paths or the bike lines, yes, they're recreation amenities. Yes, they're going to add values to the neighbors. But there's also a critical safety component here. And as we look to city plan and we want to have half of our city moving in non-cars through other means, through active, through public, through walking, um, th these aren't nice to have. They're must-haves. And we want to make sure that... Um, all of our neighborhoods we're demanding the best of, especially in, in new communities. So um, I'm prepared to support the, the recommendation today, but certainly um, I, uh, I'm excited that we will continue to demand the best of ourselves and the best of industry in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a good example of why speaking at the end is better than speaking halfway through debate. Uh, Councillor Knack. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Um, yeah, I, I'll support this. I, I, I guess I just, the, the debate confused me, not, uh, nothing to the applicants. I'm perfectly fine with what they've put forward. That's not an issue. Um, again, just, just to hear, and, and I guess this is part of why I think we had to make the motion again two weeks ago, because I must admit my confusion that I feel like we have had policy in the city for many, many years that states this is the type of built form that we want. And to continue to hear that we would have been okay with a sidewalk on either side of a collector road in a new community is mind-boggling to me because I think we have policy that says otherwise. And I think that's why we had to clarify it again two weeks ago, but I just, I really, really <laughs> need to say, like, so I, I would hope that whatever we're doing in every new neighborhood going forward on a collector road, because that, that is a huge gap. Having seen some new neighborhoods built in the ward that I represent without that infrastructure, uh, it's a huge miss. It's why kids aren't actually biking to the school in those neighborhoods and they're only driving. So, um, so that's why originally when I read the report, I didn't care that the applicants didn't want to put it in the plan amendment because I just assumed 
incorrectly for some reason that somehow our, our, what I think is clear policy direction already expects that of every location. I know, you know, having heard from UDI originally when we talked about that motion two weeks ago, the concern had been that the applicants didn't want to have to keep building a larger and larger road wide, right away because it would take away from all the green space. And that's never been our goal. Our, our goal is to say, let them continue to actually maybe even shrink the road, <laughs> have to stop building such a large road so that they can put in that other infrastructure that allows for more, more complete communities. So I'll support this, but just, uh, I, I just, I, I support it with just confusion that our policy that I think has been in place for many years at this point is still not clearly being implemented in, in some of these things. So um, I'll, I'll leave that there. I'm, I'm glad we've since provided direction to yet again, I think make explicit what I thought was already explicit. So um, forgive my frustration. It's just I, 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 I'm, I'm a little confused as to why, that's, why this is still sort of up for debate. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there and hope that this is the last time this type of conversation is up for debate when we're dealing with new neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. I will go to Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. You know, really appreciate the conversation this afternoon uh, and really appreciated the, uh, you know, the rigorous answers and technical response that the applicants had on hand to, to share how they were still meeting the, the intent and um, outcomes of, of bike plan. That was really reassuring to hear. I think as has been alluded, this is really critical infrastructure in our neighborhoods moving forward. It can be much harder to retrofit in, in the future. So really pleased to know uh, the efforts that uh, were made to ensure that those standards were being met or exceeded. Um, I also just want to give a huge thank you to our city staff team for working with the applicants to ensure that these amendments were comprehensive and, and reflected a more current uh, policy context. Uh, this is a really critical exercise in every plan amendment that we have, uh, and I, you know, really appreciate the work that goes goes into it and any outcomes that we've seen in the end. So, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing more processes that that show this sort of approach and uh, and rigor in the work. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah. So. Uh, throughout my ward, I, I actually have uh, some of these issues and uh, I get constant emails and complaints about it. It's what residents are demanding and it's actually in our policy. I can't support this. I'm not, I, I'm actually not going to support it um, uh, simply because I just, I'm tired of budging on these things. Uh, I don't think that we should be or need to be budgeting, budging on these things. I don't think it makes development harder in any way. And uh, I think that uh, the people who end up buying the product that developers build, um, you know, folks don't always look at everything. They assume that council and city administration and developers are working together to provide a complete community. And then they find out that that, oh, okay, it, it wasn't the case. Um, so when, when, we, when we do these things, it, it's just, uh, it gets very frustrating. And, and you know, look, there, there's, I understand there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things to unpack here about who's responsible for what and why. Um, but at the end of the day, Residents expect us to be making clear headed beneficial decisions for them in our planning. And we have a big ZBR debate coming up that is going to tie into all of this. And for me personally, um, I am going to vote the policy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. And I will go to Councillor Hamilton to close. Thank you, and I appreciate the rigorous uh, and fulsome debate that has happened uh, this afternoon. Um, I would uh, like to uh, share my own support for the bike plan and for having complete connected neighborhoods. Um, I, and I understand absolutely where my colleagues are coming from.
However, I want to reiterate that that the land um, that is impacted by those decisions is outside of the plan area today. Um, and so even uh, were this not to pass, um, the, the actual applicant on this has no control over whether or not that connectivity happens or not. Um, and, and I think that's sort of uh, an unfortunate reality of the, the I'm going to say, the, NSP is going into areas where there's existing country residential, where there's existing homes already, is that it, there's sort of an as-is um, environment. However, with approval of this, um, with approval of this, uh, we will enable two schools uh, to potentially get built in the area and potentially in the next 18 months to two years where they're desperately needed um, because of a growing population. Um, and and more or less for the children in the area, especially in the northern portion, to get to and from school on safe shared use paths. Um, and, and I'll say that something that has truly kept me uh, awake over the last five years is the um, uh, distraught emails from parents who have their children being bused to schools 10 kilometers, sometimes further, um, whose children can't go to school with kids across the street who live across the street from them um, and uh, and who are frustrated um, by uh, the, some of the things we've been talking about today already, which is that uh, the the amenities haven't kept up with the growth. So um, I, I want to enable um, that those schools to get built so that those children can have their own complete communities. Um, and I thank my colleagues for their support today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. And so I, with that, I will call the vote. Councillor Salvador, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Councillor Hamilton, back to you. Thank you. I'll move second reading of items 3.12, 3.13, and 3.14. Second. Okay, so second reading, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. I'll move consideration of third reading on items 3.12, 3.13, 3.14. Second. Great, thank you. And so this is consideration. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. Hold up. <laughs> that That's one for Councillor Cartmel's uh, Excel sheet. I, I even yes, specifically, I, yes, I even specifically said for consideration. Okay, I know you so did. Can we please recall the vote? We are recalling. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, just for, yep, we're gonna re recall the vote and please vote again, please, everyone. For consideration. Yes. We have all the votes. Please display the votes and that is carried. And I'll move third reading of Charter Bylaw 20612, Bylaw 20613 and Charter Bylaw 20614. Second. Great, and I will call the vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have all the votes. Perfect, please display the votes. And that is carried. And um, are there any notices of motion or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, we are adjourned at 328. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>